This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. It's the original Jingle Meisters <laughs> of Place to Be Nation Pop. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the Hard Traveling Fanboys. I am Greg Phillips. With me here in luxurious, bounteous Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, in the Hard Traveling Studios in Ho-Ho Loon Plaza. My good friend, my compatriot, and a real American hero, Nick Duke. Nick, how are you, good sir? I'm doing very well, sir. And just to show you how I feel, how I truly feel about you, Greg, I am going to buy you tall, tall trees and all the waters in the seas because I'm a fool, fool, fool for you. Well, I will, I will tell you this: uh, all of that stuff sounds good, but I'm crazy about a Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'm going to take my earnings from this week's show, and I'm going to buy me a Mercury and cruise it up and down the road. Now, see, is, is a Mercury really the wisest automobile purchase? Because you got to remember, Greg, there's something women like about a pickup man. <laughs> You're mixing your metaphors here, my friend. You're switching into Diffieisms. Listen. Because I would argue that I can't even afford a pickup right now because if the devil danced in empty pockets, he'd have a ball in mine. <laughs> you'd have a ball in yours, yes, that's true. With, with a nine foot gland, as I always heard it. <laughs> ah, oh, anyway, we need to do the uh, we need to do the all nine eighties and nineties country edition of Easy Like David Sunday, where you and I just yes. take over David's show and he just sits there and sighs the entire time. <laughs> yes, eighties and nineties country for life. Yes, I thought you were going to suggest that we create a, a, an eighties and nineties country all American team. And then put them against each other in a hypothetical <laughs> fantasy matchup. Uh, in what sport, though? Like, because that would, I don't know. That would determine a lot. Because if it's football and you got to fill out a full eleven, or even a full twenty-two, or a full twenty-five, if you're talking specialists. That's a different. That's a different ball game as opposed to something like basketball, where it's a five-on-five five affair. But oh, then again, they are country artists, so basketball will be out the window. Right. <laughs> Maybe golf. Golf. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's too hot to fish. It's too hot for golf. And it's too cold at home. It's too cold at home. So, mm. anyway, uh, we are here to bring you off the page, and apparently way off the page. Yes. Uh, this is where we take a look at a piece of comic book media that is not a comic book itself. Indeed, and uh, this could be anything from a video game to a, uh, a, video a game board a game to time. backgammon, uh, but mostly it's movies and TV shows. Right. And what we're doing here today is we are offering a review of a. Uh, I'm not even sure why we picked it for this month, but Spider Man Two by I, Sam Raimi. I can answer that question, Greg. If you if you like, if you like for me to, the the idea was I don't know if you remember last year. Uh, we did st- all a month of stuff we hated in January and then a month of stuff we loved in February. We were going to do the same thing this year, but we had Black Panther month in February, so I, I moved our month of stuff we love back, which is why this month it's all just talking about things that we just don't really have many bad things to say about. Does that mean that this is the return of the heart-traveling fanboys? I, I suppose I shouldn't have told you that, but I guess technically, yes. yes. It's my favorite time of the year other than the happies. Other than it's the happies. The heart-traveling, heart-traveling fanboys. That makes no We're here sense. To tell you about a project that we love. Mm-hmm. We love, we love, we love this movie, Spider-Man mm-hmm. Two by Sam Raimi, mm-hmm. and starring starring a, 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 a cavalcade of stars from the early two thousand and a some veritable who, heaven of stars from the early two thousand. That's right, and some who would become strong style stars later on. <laughs> now, uh, 
we've got we've got just a, a including a Kirsten Dunst, who wound up actually becoming Tomohiro Ishii, strangely enough. <laughs> Good lord! Good lord, man! Uh, uh, I'm rather proud of that one. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna do an old thing, Greg. I'm gonna say, let, let me count let me it. Tell you, let me tell you, I have never seen Tomohiro Ishii's headlights shining like. <laughs> Like, hey, listen, that was listen. This this was uh, this was what um, fourteen years ago. So you know, let's yeah. you know, don't. She had a lot of work done in the time since then. <laughs> Nipple reduction surgery. Actually, actually, given her her uh, her paleness in this movie, perhaps Minoru Suzuki would have been a better pull. But I'm going to stand by. Oh my, God, I'm going to stand by my stone pit bull. Minoru Suzuki would be an awesome like lizard, but you wouldn't even have to change anything about him. You wouldn't have to use any effects. <laughs> Minoru Suzuki, whenever they remake, whenever they do the Gus Van Sant shot-for-shot remake of uh, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, he should play the Green Goblin in it. Yes. Perfect. But yes, we are here to talk to you about uh, a very serious subject, drugs. <laughs> yeah. You can tell it's going to be a very serious podcast tonight. Uh, but and, and one of those drugs is the Green Goblin Enhancement Formula, which is featured very briefly in Spider-Man 2, the movie we're here to talk to you about today. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, we have reviewed on this very podcast and in our columns, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Nick, uh, one, two Spider-Man movies. We reviewed Spider-Man Homecoming last year, and I believe in our column... We may have, at, or in an earlier podcast, we may have briefly given our summation of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, which we are planning on actually doing an in-depth review of at some point in the future. I can't wait for that. That has become, Greg, already just... Greg and I had a very brief offline conversation about that movie today, and it is rapidly shooting up my list of most anticipated podcasts. Like, doing an off-the-page on that movie is going to be so much fun. Because it is. people, just in brief, to, to lead with this... People dump all over Spider-Man 3, and I think people don't realize just how bad The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is. It is, it is, a, it is a Ghost Rider level yeah. atrocity on the part of Sony Pictures, in my opinion. It, it is not only significantly, exceedingly worse than Spider-Man 3, it may be significantly worse than any comic book film that has followed it. Since then? Yes. Yeah, I would have. You'd have to. I'm struggling to think of one. I have not seen the uh, Josh Trank Fantastic Four. That's probably the only one either. that would immediately come either. to mind in terms yeah. of, of how it's received. To, to, to show to show you a comparison, I think Suicide Squad is better than the Amazing Spider-Man Two. Hmm, that's a that's a good comparison. You know, yeah, like it the, is. But the, Suicide Squad has has at least entertaining performances in it. And I would argue that an Amazing Spider-Man Two does have at least one of those, but we're we are we are veering wildly off topic. Yeah. That's another subject for another time. It, uh, it, it it will it will come at some point. But we we've reviewed several Spider-Man projects, and this is kind of I guess the um, maybe the uh, the white whale in the uh, in the situation <laughs> of the the prom the most prominent. Uh, Spider-Man related movie that we that there's been and we haven't really ever touched on it that much. Um, we've mentioned it a few times in some of our favorite fight scenes, for instance, or favorite superhero movies, things like that. But we've never really delved into it a lot in one of these, and so we figured what better time than to look at what is considered by critics to be the best Spider-Man movie, um, and and one that has uh, stood the test of time as kind of. A pretty groundbreaking film in its day, too. Uh, this was, uh, you know, X2 got really good reviews, but not, amazingly, not blow-away reviews like you would expect. And so I think that this movie was probably the best-reviewed superhero movie since Christopher Reeve's Superman. Because even Tim Burton's Batman didn't get... Yeah, it had, uh, it had some de- it had a know, device it had some of nature about it. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, that's probably um, true. I don't remember how Superman 2 was received, you know, because obviously I wasn't alive and... Rotten Tomatoes wasn't a thing back then. Um, right. So, yeah. Back then, they were just regular tomatoes that hadn't yet gone rotten. Hadn't yet gone rotten. That's Attack true. of the Killer Tomatoes. Remember that? They made a cartoon out of it, too. They did. I think they did a remake, actually. No, they, they remade uh, straight to DVD Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Not not Attack of the Rotten Tomatoes. My mistake. Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. You mean. Killer Tomatoes, Rotten Tomatoes. Who gives a shit? The uh, 
<clears throat> anyway, so nine this, minutes this, in, this, we have had barely any talk of Spider Man Two thus far. That's right, just telling you what this it's is going to be. It's the great challenge of when you review something that's very good. Yeah, I uh, mean, and not particularly divisive in any way. Um, so this came on the heels two years later. If I'm, this came out in oh four, right, Nick? Uh yes, that is correct. Because um, Spider Man, the first Spider-Man one, the first Sam, Sam Raimi Spider Man, remember, was slated for a December two thousand one release date and memorably featured a key sequence set in the World Trade Center. So in the wake of 9-11, they wound up delaying that movie to May and arguably kind of kicking off the now what it mm-hmm. seems like a, a, a comic book tradition of having early May big-time May superhero release, debut dates, release yeah. dates. I don't remember when X-Men came out, do you have to, but I felt I feel like it was somewhere around like, I don't know, was it a summer release? Was it? I don't even remember. Greg, not to uh, not to get your penis too hard on this, but just to st- one more aside. Uh, Ricochet will be competing in a six man ladder match at at NXT Takeover New Orleans. That sounds fair. <laughs> just wanted Decent. to just wanted to clue Decent. you in on that. That uh, Ricochet will be diving not, off ladders on your television soon. Not to not to tell tales out of school, but there may be a certain sixty second long segment. Later in the show, we'll have a chance to tell that. I forgot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My apologies. How dare we? How dare we exceed our self-imposed 60 second mandate? <laughs> That's right. Uh, but that that does that does ex- excite me and intrigue me. Uh, m- much like the uh, the waters of the uh, whatever the hell body of water that is excite Kristen Dunst's uh, body in certain scenes. What in the, the film. hell are you talking about? <laughs> Go back and watch that that sequence at the end. I just watched the movie anyway. Let's we should so probably the, get around to the movie. Premise is that this came on the heels two just two years later of mm-hmm. Spider Man One, mm-hmm. the uh, first Spider Man film by Sam Raimi, uh, and that was a monster hit. And yeah, uh, even beyond what X Men had been before it. Uh, yeah, it was it was the first like X Men made a lot of money. Don't get me wrong, X Men was was obviously wildly financially successful. But I would I would argue that you know since the Batman, the heyday of the Batman franchise back in the eighties, you know, late eighties, early nineties, this was the first bona fide superhero blockbuster. In you know what God, what would that be, Greg? Ten years at that point from ninety two to oh two because you got to remember Batman yeah. and Robin and Batman Forever, or excuse me, Batman Returns and Batman Forever also both made a lot of money. Um, so it had been yeah. a little while. So if you go from Batman Forever, which was 95, Five. it had been seven yep. years since since the genre had really hit it big at the box office. And I think this genre. one hit it, hit it big in a way that nobody really saw coming. I mean, I remember I was extremely excited for the first mm-hmm. Spider-Man movie. I was pumped yep. for it. I thought it looked awesome. Um, I had always been a fan yep. of the character, as you know. And, like, I was pumped, but even I didn't see – like, I'll give, you, I'll give you an example, Greg. There are very few times I've ever gone to see a movie – in food capital of the world, Dothan, Alabama, and the screenings actually have been sold out. But I remember that opening weekend, you could not get in the theater on Friday or Saturday, mm-hmm. pretty much all day. I wound up having to go to like a Sunday matinee just to be able to see it opening weekend because that was back in the day when there was no like advanced sales. You had to show up to the theater to buy your tickets. Oh yeah, and, whatnot. We and so st- it we was stood in, as, it went, as a as a, as an anecdote. We stood in line. I was in high school, uh, my senior year of high school, when Spider Man One came out. And we stood in line at the, the outside the theater uh, by our house in Mobile, Alabama, uh, and we stood out there in a line. I would say for probably an hour and a half waiting to get into the theater mm-hmm. uh, to buy tickets to see this movie, um, the first one. I mean, and it was it was it, everybody. I, we were pumped for it, but I don't think I expected culture to be as pumped. Yeah, for the it casual as buzz we were. that that there was, um, and so it was it was it felt. It very much felt like the kind of uh, zeitgeist that we would see years later with the uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? Uh, except at that point, it, it felt like this was going to kick down the walls and, and you give probably us superhero you, movies on a on a major level, right? You. you probably remember it because you're, you're older than I am, but like I don't, I wasn't really old enough to remember, you know, the hype going into the Tim Burton '89 Batman movie. But like, I bet, I mean, I was five, so right? I, I barely remember it. I but mean, I from people I've talked to and from what I've read online, this this one felt like the first one in my lifetime that kind of had that right around it. You same know? and um, same X X Men X Men was like people were excited for X Men, but it was it was mostly people that knew who the X Men were and right. stuff like or that. Watch the cartoon and, or something like that. Yeah, and with the, and it was very important, a, a very important movie. But Spider Man felt like 
just I remember the trailers for it looked so amazing. Yes. Like, oh my god, we're seeing what we never thought we'd see before uh, on the big screen. Uh, technology we'd never thought we'd see on the big screen. So it was uh, it was exciting from the get go, and like you said, it did feel like whatever you know, Batmania in '89. Right. I was really too young. I mean, all I remember in '89 is wanting the Happy Meal that had the with it. So, <laughs> right, right. And uh, so, I mean, what happens here is, like you said, it, Spider-Man hits massive at the box office. I believe it actually set an opening weekend record at the time. I'd have to look that up, but I'm too lazy to do it right now. If that's actually the case, but and you know, the first Spider-Man movie, you can kind of, you know, retroactively decide, you know, for yourself whether or not it holds up or not. I still like the movie a lot. I think I'm actually higher on it than you are, probably. Yeah, but, but at the time, but at the time, it was it, it, it was it was mind blowing. Right, no, I'm not. No one can deny that. Right, the and first was, time you see that movie in the theater, it's hard to replicate that. Right, and it was you know critically beloved. It made a ton of money, and so instantly, you know, talk turned to a sequel. And the expectations for this movie, you know, there was there was more excitement, I think, for Spider Man One, but I think there were higher expectations. For Spider-Man Two coming in, and as you know, expectation yes. is always a difficult thing because it can expectation can ruin an otherwise decent movie if right. it doesn't meet them. You know, and, that, and it, it it was very and concerning had, coming in. You know, and if you just play the numbers, we had just come off in two thousand three a superhero sequel that exceeded the original in X Men Two, mm-hmm. and so playing the playing the numbers, you can't figure that was going to happen again because at that time the the common knowledge among any kind of movie fans were that the sequel's never as good as the original mm-hmm. uh, with very few exceptions so it it was uh, uh, at least that that was the common knowledge whether it was true or not that was what people thought so into Spider-Man 2 you're thinking man that the, the hype is so huge for this all of us were super pumped for it and I and I wasn't nearly as cynical then as I've become in my old age I don't think I don't think culturally we were quite there with cynicism yet as as we are nowadays right so i think people were genuinely excited to see what was going to happen next but again i don't think many of us were expecting it to be better than the first we just wanted it to be as good as the first yeah i mean it's one of those things where there are certain franchises where you know you don't want every sequel to be the same thing but there are certain certain movies that come along where you're kind of like I just want more of that more of that thing you gave right. me just give me yep. more of it and that's kind of yep. where I think we all were with the first Spider-Man movie and I think this is you know we'll get into this but it's one of the brilliant things about this movie is it manages to give you a lot of those things that you got from the first one and kind of satiate that that desire while also throwing you a little bit of new and, and a little bit of different concepts here and there and kind of wind up winding up being this this great middle ground between something new and something uh, something familiar and something borrowed and something blue as well uh, yeah sure absolutely and the borrowed blue thing in this case is spider-man's suit mm-hmm. uh, well that being said folks one of the things we like to do on off the page as you all know uh, or maybe you don't know <laughs> and if you don't know, I'll tell you. We like to watch along with the audience if you have a chance. Now, if you're in your car, if you're at work, totally cool. You can still listen to it. It won't be hard to follow, hopefully. But if you're at home uh, and you're listening to us, fire up your DVD, your Blu-ray, your whatever digital version. And uh, we're going to give you a chance to dig that out. You pause the show right now if you want. And when you come back, we are going to count you in. And what we're doing is we're watching it on mute with the subtitles, and we're just we're not going to watch the whole movie. We're just going to use it to kind of remind us of uh, things here and there <clears throat> that we want to talk about or discuss. So uh, if you want to get yours going, we both have ours ready to go, and we are going to hit play in three, two, one, play. And... Uh, I think this is probably the most important aspect of the movie. This, of course, is the uh, the opening logo for the movie studio here. Yes, cool. we're seeing the Columbia Pictures. Columbia Pictures, yes. You know what's crazy, and, and and maybe it's just a part of my old age, but you know, the older I get, the fewer movies I get a chance to see in the theater. And it's like the only actual studio logos I ever see anymore are pretty much Warner Brothers and Marvel. And so it's all always weird to me to see these these logos for films that I uh, or for companies that I used to know like the back of my hand and barely recognize right. now. Yeah, that that Marvel logo by the way, it, it, was this the first time it got used in a movie? 
I don't remember, honestly. And it's one of those things that may have been tacked on retroactively to home video releases, so it's kind of hard to to speak with yeah, any real well, authority on that. I mean, it, I mean, X-Men would have been the first... Re- well, I guess Blade and the Blade... When did Blade 2 come out? Because Blade was 98 and Blade 2 was, what, 02? 01 or 02. Yeah, so like X-Men and Blade would have been the first opportunities for it. Um, and then first Spider-Man, obviously. Yeah. I'm- I've always liked the opening credit sequence to these movies. Um, I think it's cool. Especially for Spider-Man 2 oh. and Spider-Man 3 where they kind of you know, recap the events of the previous film without you having to sit down and watch it. I think it's a cool idea. I think more movies should do it. Yeah, this is... Yeah, this is great. Uh, Alex Ross... You all right over there, Greg? Hello? You all right over there? Yeah, I've been talking the whole time. Okay. Can't you hear me across the L-shaped studio? Vaguely. But anyway, let's go. Let's continue. Uh, uh... Anyway, anyway, what I was saying is Alex Ross art here. Mm-hmm. Here on this opening title sequence. Uh, now, uh, yeah, this is this was actually a really cool opening here to this movie, and it's kind of similar, not similar actually. It's actually very different from what they did with X Men, which also had a very cool opening sequence mm-hmm. uh, and kind of set the stage for. And in some ways, set the set the bar for opening title sequences for these superhero movies, which we don't uh, really one, have anymore these days. Like, right. like the idea of the opening title sequence is not really a thing. Um, yep. This is a very old school decision on the on the part of Sam Raimi, but it's one that I think serves both this movie and its inferior uh, uh, successor, Spider Man Three, to a great degree. Yeah, and it's it's a it's a style that's kind of fun. Like you know, it's an interesting way to, to dry, now your days you're just kind of dropped into movies a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, back then, this was kind of the standard was to have a title sequence uh, introducing the actors and whatnot. And I feel like this is uh, one of the better ones. And and so was X-Men. And this was kind of uh, an era when you had a lot of creativity involving that. And this kind of also sets the stage for a movie that, that does feel at times like a comic book. Yeah, but in a more in a more organic way than something like Ang Lee's Hulk, which was trying very <laughs> obviously. Yeah, which was trying to book. create like literal panels on screen and whatnot. Yeah. I agree. Um, and and they're, here we, we start the movie, and they're just kind of setting the stage of, of the uh, status quo of Peter Parker after the events of the first Spider-Man film. He's been Spider-Man for a while at this point, I think for two years. Is that correct? Since yeah, like uh, yeah. Aunt May makes reference later in the film. She specifically says two years since the death of, of Uncle Ben. So, And so he's established as Spider-Man. Uh, but he's still having that famous Parker luck where nothing mm-hmm. goes right for him. He's trying to work as a pizza delivery man, not doing a very good job at it because he's trying to balance that with being Spider-Man, and he just cannot seem... He just, well, he can't get right. <laughs> can't get right. Pizza Yurt. What a what an interesting name for a place. Yes, very much so. Uh, hey, uh, I, th- this is a good time to mention. This, this movie, by the way, is sponsored by Dr. Pepper. In case you couldn't tell, Doctor Pepper. That's right, Doctor Pepper. Look at there. Don't There's Doctor Pepper. Don't don't. Uh, you didn't go where I thought you were going to go with a Doctor Pepper reference, and I'm glad you didn't go there. And I appreciate and respect the fact that you didn't, Nick. I'm confused as to what you even mean. Well, you didn't. I, I don't even. I dare not even put give an oh, utterance. Oh no! Come on! Come on! You didn't make any mention to the temperature of the Doctor Pepper or the. Uh, I see what we're doing here. I get it. I follow, I follow what you're you're talking about. That little sweet guy with diet, Doctor Pepper. I get you. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. That's the ticket. <clears throat> so uh, this whole uh, he's rich, what Biatch. <laughs> well, yeah, it totally is that guy. Is <laughs> I was trying to place him. It's Ashley Larry. Earlier. It is. It's Ashley Larry. Or beautiful. There he is. Depending on your preferred Chappelle yeah. show character. I go with beautiful. I like beautiful as well. Actually, Larry is yeah. just the one most people recognize more. more right. That is, <laughs> getting off topic once more, is there a more underrated sketch in the history of Chappelle's show than the player haters ball? I don't know that it's underrated. I, I think like it is. I think, I think when people talk about like the five or ten best Chappelle show sketches, it's often left off the list. I don't think it is now. I think, I think maybe is. at one time it was. I feel like it's now become... Uh, Earned its rightful well, place in history? Earned. Yes, earned its rightful place in history as being amazing. Now, I'll tell you what's underrated. 
was the 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 one from the uh, the cut the the cut sketch from uh, season three where they go back in time. The yeah. <laughs> That one's underrated. Well, that one is like just an entire thing of like the player haters and in increasingly bizarre situations. Because doesn't that also yeah. have like the um, the gay KKK or whatever in it as well that they have a face off with or something? I can't remember. I can't remember that. This I, actress I, I, in this scene, by the way, looks familiar, and I can't place her. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, th I love this scene, by the way. This is a great physical comedy scene for Pete. Uh, this was that's another thing about this movie. I haven't watched this in a long time, and. It's a lot funnier than I remember it being. Yeah, and uh, a lot funnier in like most people when you would say Spider-Man humor, you would think in a in a sarc like a more sarcastic, uh, witty, like rapidly flying dialogue kind of way, kind of like what you get in Homecoming, and even to a lesser degree in the Amazing Spider-Man sequels. But this one, and I'm gonna I'm gonna use the term slapstick, but I don't mean it in a negative fashion. This just has no, a, lot, a lot more of that than you would expect, especially, like, if this movie were made today, none of that would be in there, is, is the way yeah, I would, the, the, I would the physical the physical humor aspect of, of kind of a guy where just bad stuff keeps happening to him. Right. Funny, funny, bad things happening to him. By the way, that actress you were thinking about, I don't think, I'm almost positive this isn't her, but I know why she looks familiar to you, because her face looks very similar to Alexandra Daddario. No, I, I, I feel like there's an, I feel like there, there, that she played somebody, I don't know. I'm look. I'm trying to look her up right now. So you you continue talking. That's who I thought it was at first. Was I was entered to the Dario, and I was like, I don't know why she looks familiar. Apparently, it's Zoe Deschanel's sister. So she looks really? like Zoe Emily, Deschanel. Emily yeah, Deschanel. Yeah, from Bones. Uh, yeah, yeah, she, Bones. Yeah, yeah. She. That's who that is. All I've got are my bones. Right. I don't know what you mean uh, by that, but okay. <clears throat> he's the. Uh, she was also the in the ultra filling the Nicole Kidman film, Cold Mountain. Cold Mountain. Elizabeth Banks in 04. Not what? not awful. That was Elizabeth Banks? Yes. Wow. I guess I didn't recognize her as a brunette. Anyhow, uh, J. Jonah Jameson here. Is, uh, this is our first chance to check him out, and he's he's brought over just as much uh, <laughs> amazing charisma as he brought in the first movie. He Has there ever been – I mean, maybe there have been casting choices as good. Has there ever been a better casting choice than this than, – than, than, than this J. Jonah Jameson. It is... J.K. Simmons. Like, I am trying to think about how great it is. It's difficult to put into words. Like, there are great casting decisions that work out. Like, for example, right. Heath Ledger as the Joker. That He gives a great performance. He gives a great take. But you can do that character a variety of different ways to the point where Heath Ledger isn't necessarily essential to portraying that character on screen. With this... To veer a little, a little bit off topic, then I'll bring it back full circle, Greg. Did you know they're making a live-action version of The Lion King that's coming out, like, next year? No, I, I did not know that. Okay, well, my point here, the reason I bring it up is because they're recasting all these roles for The Lion King, you know, to do a CGI-slash-live-action movie, and they're, they're casting all these new people in these familiar roles, and they had the wisdom at one point to go, you know what? Is anybody really going to do the voice of Mufasa better than James Earl Jones? And they realized the answer was no. And so instead of forcing a recast, they just cast James Earl Jones. If they ever get around to doing J.J. in, in, the, in the Homecoming franchise, don't reinvent the wheel. Don't try to be too smart for your own good. Just get J.J. Simmons to do what? it. The wheel, so to speak. Thank you. The, and, 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 I, and they will get around to doing J.J. at some point, and I agree with you completely. they there, at this point, to me, there is no reason to ever have anyone else play J.J. Jameson. I agree. And, and honestly, it's not like there's any age component to Jonah. No, there's not. You like, can make it whatever you want it to be, you know? Right. You can make him as old as you need. It's not like you need to age with Peter. You can just make him old. And given the status of things over in the DCEU corner, it's not like he's going to be tied up doing Commissioner Gordon <laughs> stuff. That's right. That means he won't have... He won't, <laughs> Instead of instead of focusing on the width and the girth of the mustache, he can just focus on the uh, the, uh, the 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 prettiness of the mustache. But no, it is it's like it is the most one of the most perfect casting. It is you know it's a bit role, so it's hard to put it necessarily on this level. But it is Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark yes. level good. Like that's the yes. only one that honestly comes to mind if you're looking for a one to one comparison. Because I think Except as we've discussed before, you know Chris Reeve as Superman, Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. You know, uh, Chris Evans as Captain America. Those are all things that like are great in their own right. But I think it's conceivable 
to at least imagine somebody else doing it at some point or another and it being somewhat effective. I can't imagine anyone ever playing J. Jonah Jameson other than J.K. Simmons or anyone ever playing Tony Stark besides Robert Downey Jr. and it ever working. I mean, those I those two actors are so tied to those two characters in my mind that I, I can't divorce myself from it. Agreed. The primary difference between them, to me, is that Robert Downey Jr. took a comic book character and transformed him into his own personality. <laughs> right. And, uh, and J.K. took a comic book character and literally became that comic book character. Right. In, in a way that, like... And you know what's even weird? Go back and watch the 90s Spider-Man cartoon. And retroactively, the guy doing the voice of J. Jonah Jameson on that show sounds like J.K. Simmons' J. Jonah Jameson. Yes. One of the great travesties of the uh, Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon is that you know it was such a terrible show that it caused people to not watch more of J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. Right. Uh, so we've established at this point that J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah is awesome and brings all of that back to this one. Uh, here we're here we see a scene that is introducing us to the rest of. Again, we're still setting up the status quo. What is what is Peter's life like at this point? Two years in the future from what we saw in the last movie, he's still friends with Harry Osborn, who's played by James Franco here, and uh, they but they have a little bit of tension now because all Harry knows about his dad is that he was killed in his opinion, by Spider-Man, from every appearance. It, it, because uh, Norman made Peter promise not to tell Harry about the Green Goblin. And because Bernard, for some reason, is intentionally withholding that information from him. Oh, we'll get to Bernard in a little bit, my friend. I'm going to give you a chance, and myself a chance, to talk about our old friend Bernard. Bernard. And I do I do mean old. Good lord, he's just so old. <laughs> so, <laughs> why did Bernard and Aunt May ever hook up in these movies? A physical impossibility, I'm pretty sure. Work, damn it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so, Swedish uh, made penis and larger pumps than me. This sort of thing is my bag baby. Signed uh, by Bernard. By Bernard. <laughs> Not Bernard. 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 That is important. You must note the pronunciation of the name. That's right. Peter would be stuck with a guy named Bernard. That's, that's different. <laughs> but, uh, so, anyhow, uh, uh, Bernard aside, so Nor Storm and Norman uh, to to Harry was this kind of distant father figure that that was murdered by this menace known as Spider Man for no reason, according as far as Harry knows. And Peter, while he, he's still best friends with Harry. Harry sort of resents the fact that Peter knows Spider-Man and is kind of has a relationship with Spider-Man and won't tell him who Spider-Man is and help Harry get his revenge on him. Uh, so there's a little bit of tension there between them. There's tension between Pete and MJ because he is intentionally trying to keep distance between them, uh, even though they were bonding in the first movie, because he doesn't believe that Spider-Man can have a relationship because of the, you know, the cliched superhero stuff at this point of, you know, he'll put her in danger if, if his enemies find out about her. But at this point, that wasn't really cliche because you didn't see a lot of superhero movies at that time. So uh, setting up the status quo, and that's what I think is so great about this movie. You've gotten all of the character establishment essentially out of the way in the first movie. The only new characters that you see here of any importance are the villain, Dr. Octopus, and uh, and I and you know you could argue John Jameson, but again, not a John Jameson character. is barely in the movie though. Like, yeah, he's barely he's barely in the movie. Yeah, it's such a weird so, thing that I will. I mean, I'm sure we'll discuss this more in depth as we go along. But like one of your three co leads in the movie, arguably in 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 uh, Dunst, McGuire, and and uh, Franco, and you have one of them get in like get into a marriage subplot and barely feature their fiance at all. It's a really weird decision on the part of. On the part of Raimi, I thought. Yeah, uh, but at the same time, it's hard to look at the movie. and It's already two hours and seven minutes, I think, and think about, well, they should have cut this. Because the one thing about these movies, all or at least I can't remember the third one as well, but the first two, they are hyper-focused on Peter. He is, he is the focal point, with the mm -hmm. only exception being occasional cutaways to, uh, to Doc Ock. And for everything, every scene in this movie serves the story, in other words, that they're trying to tell. And I think that in that case, 
it's all through the eyes of Peter. And so Peter is learning this new information about uh, MJ that he previously didn't know. Here's a scene that, that uh, where she just casually drops information on him that she's uh, seeing somebody right now. Mm-hmm. After stroking his face and petting it, like Tommy petting his sail. Um, right here, petting his face. Now, wouldn't that... I'm not good at reading signs, Nick, but isn't that generally a sign that a, that that, that, a, that a person likes you? Yeah, that should be a, that should be a pretty you know pretty good sign. What she did, I mean, she kissed him at the end of the first one, so you know yeah, he should true. know that that uh, she's into him or whatever. Yeah, but he doesn't what, act; he just stares. What about the fact that he just asked her if she was still in the village, and she just ignored the question? I mean, when a, when a man asks you a question, woman, just answer it. And here she is casually. Oh, I'm seeing somebody new. You mean like a boyfriend? This well, is uh, this is very manipulative on her part. I am, I, you know, in hindsight, I have become less and less of a fan of this of this version of MJ um, as I get older. It is it is not ideal in my mind. Well, I, I'm kind of of two minds about it, Nick, uh, and, and we'll 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 address more of that here. I I think I think in some ways, I think that's kind of in a way why this relationship works is because they're kind of both like real people in the fact that they don't ever really say exactly what's on their minds at a given time. Yes, and I'm not manipulate I'm, one another. I'm not I mean, debating that that MJ could potentially be realistic in terms of her being manipulative. I'm just saying she's a bitch and therefore somewhat unlikable when she does these things. Well, yeah, I mean I, I don't think she's a complete bitch in this movie. I think she has some decisions that are like that, but I think Peter makes some bad decisions too with I, I, you know regards to he's trying he, Peter's a guy that always tries to do the right thing. But right. I think in the process of trying to do the right thing, he unintentionally does things that hurt people around him. I agree with that, but I would. I, my, I guess my point is, MJ does things that she knows aren't right at various points, and they hurt Peter, and they hurt other people around her. Was this, and then you couple that with, I don't think the performance is very good either. Was this uh, 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 <laughs> that landlord is creepy as hell? By the way. Uh, was this this, uh, this skinny so landlord's far? daughter? I thought was going somewhere because they have her pop up in the third one, and it just never. It's just it's just one of those things that is like this this random side path that Sam Raby decided to go down with no real intention of ever ex- yeah, you know fulfilling yeah, I, it. I can't. I, it's, I'm not going to hold what, what doesn't happen in the third against it. But my the way I read it was kind of setting her up almost as possibly an alternate love interest for Peter. But maybe at the time, I mean, when I saw this movie, I thought, well, maybe this is Peter's kind of chance to move past MJ right you know and accept his Spider-Man role but that's not how it plays out it's kind of like a red herring i guess you would mm-hmm. say um but anyway so uh the 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 three leads we set it up but yeah what i'm saying is what makes this so cool is origin movies by their nature have to get bogged down in introducing this entire cast of characters mm-hmm. Now you've shed those shackles. You pretty much only have one new character you're introducing in this movie that's a major character, and that's right. your villain. Right. And everybody else is established. We care about them. We know who they are. And you're able to hit the ground running, set up the status quo in the early going of the movie, and then you don't have to tell us what Peter Parker's personality is. You don't have to tell us what MJ's personality is or what Harry's personality is. We know. And so you can just get right to the story right to the plot, and right to the uh, established character interactions. Um, And I think right out of the bat, we're seeing Harry has changed a little bit from the first movie. He's, quote, maturing a little bit, but he's still that immature, you know, uh, cocky kid that he was in high school. Just now he's thrust into a role of a corporate executive and clearly isn't really ready for that emotionally or mentally. Now we also meet Otto Octavius, not Otto Schmidt. <laughs> and uh, uh, Otto Octavius is a character that I would argue the uh, – is a, we've been over this before on the show, and I've made this somewhat controversial remark that I think this is another example of a movie drastically improving a character from the comics counterpart. And every time you, you, you knock on, on Doc Ock from the comics, I just kind of – I kind of wonder what Spider-Man villains you do like because you – you know, Spider Man has, I think, inarguably anyway, in, in terms of Marvel solo heroes, the deepest rogues gallery of anyone, and you you seem to have a disdain for a lot of his a lot of his villains. I do. I, I, I'm not I'm not making any, any bones about that. I, disdain's a strong word, but listen, when I was I can tell you when I was a kid, if Doctor Octopus was on a comic cover, I wasn't gonna buy it because I found him lame. 
I thought he was a one-dimensional, one-note character that looked like Elton John. <laughs> he Not did exactly. have some Elton John-like tendencies in his, in his character, but the, the idea of Doc Ock, to me anyway, that's always made him interesting, is the advantage that Peter has over the vast majority of his rose gallery is that he's smarter than pretty much all of them. The two glaring exceptions being Norman Osborn and Dr. Octopus. And, and those, the lizard. And the lizard, you can and kind Connors. of you can kind of have that debate, because Connors and, and Peter at various points in the comics have kind of been portrayed as being fairly equal, you know, in, in terms of being closer to being peers almost um, in intellectual level than, than Osborn or uh, Octavius. But the point being, and to me that was always why they interested me, is because Peter was actually going to have to figure out how to beat these guys because he wasn't going to be able to just outsmart them at every turn. So I always dug Octavius, personally. I don't know. Ultimately, didn't it usually turn down, come down to somehow tricking Doc Ock into tangling his arms up or something? Or shocking himself, kind of what he does. Here, I mean, if actually. we're if we're if we're talking exclusively like '60s and '70s silver and bronze age stuff, then yes, you know, later stories were not as simplistic as that. Um, my point being, yes, I don't like Doc Ock in the comics that much. Uh, now, modern Doc Ock could be different. I don't know, but the traditional Doc Ock never appealed to me. I never particularly liked. Uh, 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 there are a lot of Spider-Man villains I didn't particularly like when I was a kid. I can't help it. But I did like others. I liked uh, I liked Venom as a kid, which I know is is somewhat controversial in some circles. But what I circles? Like what Venom. circles is that controversial in? Some some don't like not just Russell. Uh, Russell's our friend, and he doesn't I like just, Venom very much. I didn't say anything about kid. Russell. You said that some people, some people else, a lot of people don't like Venom. Actually, it's it's pretty. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying I mean, that I think I, th- I don't think liking Venom as a villain is necessarily a controversial opinion. That's all I'm all I'm saying. I think it, was I think it is. A kid, but it became one as '90s comics became less cool. Oh so. God! The, yeah, the anti '90s comics thing is right. That's a good point. That, that, that uh, is a that is a growing movement that has come along. I, yeah. I enjoyed I enjoyed the Venom and I enjoyed the Carnage to a yeah. degree, and I, I liked the uh, and the, I, I like some of the weirder Spider-Man villains too, like Mysterio. I was oh, Mysterio was great. interesting because of uh, my only issue with Mysterio everything. is that I feel like Mysterio and the Chameleon should both not exist at the same time, like. I feel like it's very yeah. redundant to have those two. Um, the worst, the worst was the rose. I don't even, bad. I don't even remember that. The ro- the rose was it was a kind of a, a, a lame, a lame character. Uh, but then, yeah, the uh, uh, but I, yeah, I don't like some of those. Oh, oh, and of course, of course, uh, 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 I think mine and, and Russell's both favorite, other than other than Harry, our favorite uh, uh, Spider Man villain, uh, 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 not Kurgan. Craven. The Craven, Craven, the Craven the Hunter. Why did I get Kurgan stuck in my head? Uh, I guess you. Just, I guess you just had Golga and. Uh, uh, oh, was, <laughs> <laughs> who was the other one? Oh like, God, Golga and, uh, Golga and Kurgan yeah. and. Um, fucking hell! Giant Silva. Giant Silva, yes, yeah. and Luna. But right? I was thinking. I was thinking. Yeah, and Luna. Yeah, I, I was thinking more. Uh, uh, Truth Commission Kurgan. Yeah, and I was but, thinking uh, Oddities Kurgan. After all, yeah, that was yeah. our that was our unfortunate introduction into the insane clown posse in in professional wrestling. God. A thing we could have done without. I'd argue they would later become active roster wrestlers in WCW. Yes, I'm aware of that. That's why I said it was a thing we could have done without. But hey, he can't you know afford things. Great... He's poor. That's the that's the joke there. You know, it's a you know, it's a great thing is uh, uh, Mike Awesome gives that one ICP guy <laughs> the uh, awesome bomb on the top of the, the fat chick thriller van. They should and, bring uh, back uh, ICP and, and he have slides him. off and falls to his doom. <laughs> they should bring ICP back and have him feud with uh, Brock Lesnar. I'm good with it. The ICP and the Singh brothers versus Brock Lesnar and Andy Kent. Where they literally have it in an Olympic stadium, uh, wherever the shot put is held, and they just see how far each one can fly. <laughs> we've di- we've diverged wildly, yeah, uh, but nonetheless. When's that ever stopped us before? Never. 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 So, uh, I don't even remember what the hell we were talking about that said all no, that. No, who knows. You know what's great about this scene? Spider-Man villains. You know what's great about this scene, Greg, right here? What's that? 95% of it is practically practically done. Yep. <laughs> like it. That, that is one of those things that I continue to get, just get hung up on, especially re-watching a lot of these movies is, you know... I am not as anti CGI as you are, but I have come to the come to the conclusion that I I prefer the Chris Nolan approach. Whereas you CGI only when you must, and if you can yeah. do it practically, do it practically. 
Right, and and that's the one of the things that we will we will get into, uh, and we we might as well get into it now. This is a movie that came out in two thousand four. Right now, at the time, yes, when it came out in the theater, this was the most cutting edge CGI I think that we had seen, right. maybe outside of a Star Wars movie. Right, this was cutting edge technology. This was yep. like nothing Top we shelf. had ever seen. Nobody yeah. criticized it. At the time. No, now in hindsight. Some of these scenes stand out, like some of the the in the 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 beginning of the movie when he was swinging in daylight through the city. Yeah, pretty fake looking. Yeah, uh, there's a scene at the end of the movie in particular where there are these just blatantly fake CGI helicopters right. that show. Or even just now it. in that chase sequence when he was sitting in the car, it was very very clearly like the old like 70s style. You know, the car is practical, but they're just like a moving set of images behind them rather than actually filming on a street or something like that. So, right, you know, but. That being I, said, I am sorry. Point, we we keep getting we keep getting sidetracked, and this never happened. And I typically hate these sort of fan theory, fantasy booking things. But the, the Bruce Campbell as Mysterio thing should have happened if Spider Man Four was ever a thing. Yes, yes, I agree. This is a great scene, by the way. <laughs> yeah, he's great. I, he's I, great I, in every single like all yeah. three roles he plays in this trilogy are all great. For those that aren't watching with us, Bruce Campbell as the uh, as the usher, yes, the uh, the the, <laughs> the condescending usher that will. Uh, I'm gonna. I, I've been in situations like that where there's been a condescending usher who has uh, <laughs> who has scolded me for my behavior in <laughs> in a in a theater. So uh, even a, even as an employee of a of a of a university that is putting on. <laughs> Said oh my god, so. the subtitles are cracking me up because it's not just for, the, for this Asian lady singing. It doesn't just say spins a web any size. The subtitles actually say a spins a web any size. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> so so Campbell playing this this condescending usher is great. Yes. And again, the park the way that they get across the Parker luck in this movie may be done better than any of the other movies that I've seen because the guy just cannot catch a break. Right, like. And that's and isn't that ultimate? Hey, I, you know that was a subplot they never explored right there. Uh, the, uh, but that, I think that's something that everybody identifies with. You know, that's kind of the the ancient tale of Spider Man is that people identify with him because you're young, you're awkward, you feel like you have bad luck, you're not popular, and so Peter Parker is all of those things. And then he can put on the suit and get to escape that for a brief time and become something else. And I think this does a good job of. Establishing just kind of what a kind of what a what a crappy life he has right now. Mm-hmm. His, his, the girl that he's madly in love with is dating another guy. He's trying to be Spider Man and trying to help people, but in his personal life, nothing's going right. Yeah, I, I would I would tend to agree with that. And here's a here's a clear homage to uh, uh, Richard Donner's Superman. Yeah, I mean clearly, but there's nothing wrong with that. No, not at all. Um, yeah, and here, like you mentioned earlier, it, it is the CGI is more glaring when it's daytime. At nighttime, right. this doesn't looks great. It doesn't bother me, you know, even today. No. And Greg, no, now we should really we good. I guess we should both mention Greg that we're Greg and I are each <laughs> each actually watching full screen DVD <laughs> versions of this movie because we've never <laughs> upgraded. And back then, when we had square televisions, full screen was a thing. So we're not exactly watching in the optimal picture quality, but you know, we're doing the best we can to comment on the visuals. Yes. Now, now I, I can already hear some of you <laughs> sending emails to the loneliest email addresses on the internet, Greg P at PlaySpeedNation.com, Nick D at PlaySpeedNation.com, and you're saying to us, oh, oh, hard-traveling fanboys, oh, oh, why why would you disrupt the director's vision by getting a damn full-screen picture? E- even when you had a square television, you should have got the widescreen, just dealt with the letterbox format. And I suggest to you that if you want to watch black bars take up... <laughs> Seventy percent of your screen—that's your prerogative, yeah, quite frankly. I don't—I don't mind widescreen now that that large televisions are actually oh. affordable. But do you remember how much large televisions cost back then, Greg? Not to mention the fact that if you bought one, the things weighed like four hundred pounds and were impossible to move. Um, yeah, I got one sitting in my room right now that I'm going to have to unload uh, when I move here in a few weeks. Yeah, so, so like. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I had a small television. I was in college at the time, yep. or high school yep. at the time, and then college shortly after. You know, I I got widescreen because I had to. Ma- I had to maximize my minutes, and by minutes, I mean my screen size. It is like a good friend of mine used to say, the big cat Ernie Lyatt. He'd say, "I'd rather fight a man than love a woman." <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with anything, but we're gonna. I'll, I'll well, allow that's it. That's your opinion. I'll that's allow your it. Opinion. 
Who is this guy? That's what I was going to ask Nick when I was watching this earlier. This guy, I know him. What is yes. He, what, who is he? he? I believe his first name is Hal. He featured on, if you remember the VH1 series, I Love Thee. The 80s, 90s, yes, and 2000s. that's where I know him from. Yes, yep. he was heavily featured in that as some sort of comedian. Uh, I'm not really sure, you know, what um, what his actual claim to fame is, but that is what we know him for. And that was a good scene, too. The uh, Particularly the kind of rides up in the crotch line was, was, yeah. was particularly clutch. Which begs some questions. I mean, that, that's got to get uncomfortable after a while. I'm trying to look up this, guy, this guy's uh, full full name. Um, pay- and here's another scene that dates the movie: a payphone. Hal Sparks is his name. Hal Sparks. Yep, I'm I'm familiar with him. So here, here Peter has to use a, a payphone as opposed to a cell phone. Yes, that was still a uh, a commonly used thing. And he leaves the uh, the message here for for MJ. And he, again, the scene: another example of the poor Parker luck as his call limit runs out and he doesn't have enough change on him to continue the call. You may have also known Hal Sparks Reg in, in the crucial role of skateboarder in um, in the Adventures of Lois and Clark. I, I'm may I no yeah I could not could not tell you that, but I can tell you that uh, the uh, I guess we should get on to the character of Mary Jane. This is a character that you have grown to despise over the years. Not despise, I, 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 I guess, yeah, I, you know that's a strong word, but. A character that you you do no you no longer have an attachment to the way that no. people did when they first saw these movies. Yeah, and I get that because I've never been, as you know, in, in my Spider Man reading, I've never been a huge MJ fan in general. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, the the characterization in the movies I've always been kind of okay with. But you know, nothing. You know, she's not she's not uh, Emma Stone's Gwen Stacy. From no, the Amazing Spider-Man. She's not even close to Emma Stone's Gwen Stacy. But, but I, I do think controversial that, opinion. She isn't whatever that actress's name is, Liz Allen from uh, or Liz Toomes from Homecoming. Uh, At least know. Liz is nice to Peter. Like MJ in these movies well, I think is MJ so is too. Uh, no at, at times, yeah. but then she veers so wildly between like being it's fond of Peter and then being a complete bitch to him. Like earlier, like later on in the because movie, he lies to her constantly. Later on in the movie, Greg, we're going to get to this, and I mentioned this earlier on the phone with you. She is going to say to Peter, you know, after all these years of friendship, all all you are to me now is an empty seat, and. What years of friendship is she talking about? In the first movie, she barely acknowledges him until well, like she breaks up with Flash, and there's only two years that have passed. So, what are all these years of friendship? What is this? What is this great debt that you feel Peter Parker owes you? You know, like it's 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 ridiculous. You live next door to the guy practically your entire life, and you've only started associating with him in the last two years, and all of a sudden he owes you all these things. Screw you! Shut up. Well, they're supposed to be best friends. They yes, but that, that is the first movie. That is, you know, that has 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 only been a thing for the last two years of Peter's life. You know, you don't right. know what he has going on. Her point, her point is, uh, uh, Harry Osborn shows up to her stuff. Her ex boyfriend, by the way, Harry Osborn doesn't have any responsibilities because Harry Mo- Harry Osborn has that Harry's old has that old fuck money. He's, he's running his dad. Harry Osborn is company. running the Meat Sauce Mafia and nothing else at this point. <laughs> he has to run a multi-million dollar corporation. Yes. Her new boy, her new boy. I, I am sure that I'm sure that Harry Osborn is actually making calling all the shots and not just being a figurehead. <laughs> her her new boyfriend, American hero John Jameson, has attended five of her performances. Well, that's because he, that's because he's an astronaut, and when he's not in space, what the fuck else is he going to do? Oh, that is a disrespectful comment. Astro- didn't Apollo thirteen teach you anything? Astronauts have to have to they have to sit around and wait to be called for a moon mission. Yeah, they sure do. They have to go through the chambers and whatnot. My to, point being that, like, of all the people, to, they have to eat the banana chips and whatnot. Of all the people she references in that little monologue about how all these people have come to her show, the only person in a similar life situation to Peter in terms of financial situation is her dad, who she. Instantly mentions, yeah, and he begged me for money after the show. So you know what? Shut up. Peter's got to work. Stop being such a bitch about it, and stop being like, stop trying to hold stuff over his head that you really don't have any right to hold over his head. She, I, I and you know, and if we're talking about the character in general. I, you know, we are talking about just this film today, but you kind of have to take a holistic view of the character and the way she was approached in the trilogy. And Spider Man Three does her no favors no, whatsoever. No, Spider Man, Spider Man Three does no care, favors to several characters, right. including Peter, but. 
I am saying yeah. that in terms of her like her her portrayal and you know her relationship with Peter, to me it was a it was a a law of diminishing returns, and it is the one the only aspect that got worse throughout the series as opposed to better. I would say that, in my opinion, I think that MJ in these movies. I think when I was younger, I, I took more of the viewpoint of why is she being mean to Peter? And now I get it a little bit more. I don't think that she, if she was more one dimensional, I would agree with you, but she clearly has feelings for Pete and she clearly cares for Pete and he just keeps pushing her away constantly and then trying to get back into her life. And then she's saying, no, look, either you're in or you're out and clearly you're out. And then he's only a Sith deals in absolutes, ex- Greg, which is, which is by the way, an absolute. So of course, so ultimately what we're getting at is you take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have the facts of life. I, I'm just saying that like, I find the character to be inconsistent, and I understand part of that is is intentional to attempt to capture some of the wishy-washy nature of MJ from the comics. But I think they do it in a poor fashion here because they use MJ's wishy-washiness as exclusively – you know, the only thing she ever does is wishy washy is her attitude towards Peter. Like, she's manipulative towards him. She's blatantly manipulative later in the movie towards John Jameson, which we ultimately don't care about, you know, because we don't have any reason right. to be attached to that character. I, but, like, but she's I, not I, a very I, good person in these I don't movies. See, I don't really see how she manipulates Peter in this one. I, I, I see I see it more as... Well, we just talked about that, that earlier scene where she goes on this long, like... <laughs> they're having this long conversation. She's, in, you know, stroking his her, his face with her hands, and then she, like, walks away and casually she, drops on him. Oh, by the way, I'm seeing someone. I, Greg, that, think, is, that is as manipulative I, I, as it gets. Come on. Like, I I'm here I'm here with you. I want to praise this movie, and I love to, most things about it. MJ just sucks. To a degree, I can agree with you that it's... I mean, I don't think manipulative is the word I would use. I think the thing is... She clearly cares about Peter, and she wants him – she clearly wants to be with him, but she knows that he's lying to her, and he won't be honest with her, and he won't show up to these things, and he won't be supportive of her Sorry, in I the had, way that she wants him to be. I had to laugh because if, if the red flashing lights weren't enough, they had to pop up system unstable on the screen in giant letters to make sure everyone understands which, there's some sort of which issue. Which also used to pop up, I believe, when the WCW tag team High Voltage would come to the ring. By the way, in a, in a series of like cameo per- appearances in this movie, the guy who was running that console was actually Daniel Day Kim. Uh, later, go on, he would go on to Lost fame as the character of. Uh, Is of, his real name Daniel Day Kim, like yeah. Daniel Day Lewis? Uh, well, it's D A E, you know, in a, in a uh, Daniel Day Kim. Uh, uh, he's done other things as well, but that's pre- that's predominant where people would know him from. From would be Lost. Who is um, the who? Who plays uh, uh, Doc Ock's wife here? She, she she's familiar as well. I. Do not know the answer to that question. Um, I would have to once again. The shadow knows. Yeah. My point being, like in a movie that is full of things to praise, I think MJ is the one area that this movie really opens itself up to some realistic criticism on. And I only halfway agree with that I, because I, I, I don't I don't dislike MJ the way that that, uh, that you do in this one. I feel that I feel there's blame to go around in there in there struggling relationship there is certainly Um, blame to go around and then it's just you know it's all about how you process that 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 blame and peter tends to do it in a what i would argue is a better fashion than mj fair enough i and i will say there's there's there are a few worse actions other than trying to blow up the city in the movie worse than uh than mj's waiting until their marriage their wedding day to decide that she doesn't want to be with John James. Yes, and also basically, without his knowledge, holding a kissing audition, you know, to make sure that she wants to marry him. Like, she is clearly... That's a good point. She that's is, a good that's point. what I said, like, she is, like, even if you do want to disagree with me about manipulating Peter, how is she not being a complete bitch to John Jameson? Absolutely, you know, you're right about that. And how did John Jameson have a dad like J. Jonah Jameson and turn out to be so uh, 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 noble? <laughs> well, you know, there are, there are numerous instances of that throughout history. Look no further than my own situation, so there you are. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Mar. Well, quite frankly. Uh, the, uh, uh, and this, uh, more so than oh. probably any scene in the entire trilogy, this is like the one scene where Sam Raimi gets to let loose with his heart. I mean, because that's what he is at his heart. Yeah, Sam Raimi's a horror, horror director, director. Yep. and this is his one chance to let loose of that in terms of the way that the, uh, the, the entire scene is framed. 
we haven't even talked. We've been this whole time talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the main players, so to speak. We haven't even talked about Alfred Molina much. As I, I started going that direction, and we got, you know. We yeah, we got sidetracked with me complaining that you don't like any Spider-Man villains. Right. Uh, which is not exactly true, but as I, as I mentioned, but the uh, this 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 scene is awesome. Yes, and this is Sam Raimi one hundred and one. Yes, uh, horror over the top, but but scary and and a, and a way to make Doc Ock scary because I never. That's the other thing about Doctor Octopus in the comics. I was never afraid of him. Like he was never a character that made me think, "Oh no, Spider Man's fighting Doctor Octopus today." Even when they did the uh, the famous rivalry with. Uh, was it uh, Eric Larson and um, oh Tim would Tim would know Eric Larson and uh, Peter David actually were having a pissing contest because uh, one of them one of the, uh, I think it was uh, 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 Peter David had uh, or like I'm probably getting this backwards actually it probably was Eric Larson that had uh, Doc Ock uh, beat up the Hulk and uh, and so Peter David got pissy about it and came back in the next issue and had the Hulk beat up Doc Ock. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that, other than that, I never really bought him as a as a threat, really as a scary threat. And in this movie, this scene alone does so much to make him a scary, menacing figure. Um, now, you know, I can't speak too heavily about the classic six one six interpretation of the character, so I'm not really sure how much of that found its way in eventually. I know the 60s stuff I've read, it was not there. But this movie does something that the Ultimate Universe had done when they introduced uh, Doc Ock very shortly before this movie w- came out to make me think that it may have been a, you know, something. I don't know if Bendis was playing off what he knew was going to be in this movie or if they took some inspiration from what Bendis was doing. But the idea that the the arms are kind of a personality unto themselves mm-hmm. – um, that was in the that was in the Ultimate Universe, and and this is something that I that I actually like, and I think does make itself a little bit more interesting than the just straightforward um, interpretation that I've seen in the Six One Six Universe. Right, I agree, and that's that's something here is that they establish by letting us meet Otto before the accident, we see that he's a brilliant scientist, but we also see that he's not unhinged really in any way. He's maybe a little bit too obsessed with his work. But he has a good, happy marriage. He's a happy guy. He's a nice guy. He kind of takes Peter under his wing a little bit mm-hmm. and mentors him a little bit. And by making, by, by establishing that aspect of his character, to me, it instantly makes him more interesting than a mad scientist. Here is and the uh... he's turned mad. He's turned mad by these, you know, uh, these arms, arms these, yeah. these artificial arms that have this artificial intelligence. That's mm-hmm. bonded to him, and it kind of turns him mad. But he's not, in and of himself, a villain, so to speak. Agreed. Um, just because he's on screen right now, barely. How, you know, in a in a pretty solid franchise, how short you know short change was Robbie Robertson? By the way, yes, he pops up occasionally to just kind of be bewildered. Yeah, and to say things like in, in vague defense of Spider Man, but Ro- Robbie's kind of one of those characters that you know throughout the. Publishing history just became gradually more important, and they don't really treat him with any of that level of importance here in the in these movies. If they have Robbie in uh, in the new Spider Man series, you know it's going to be Keenan Thompson, right? Oh God, Robbie doesn't have to necessarily be fat. Like you can you can cast a, a skinnier Robbie. I think. Well, I'm just saying he's there. He's there, and he can do it. He could do it. You're right. Uh, the uh, uh, yeah, so. Doc Ock is just one of the best, uh, <laughs> the best aspects of this movie. Oh yeah, this is a great. What scene. a great! Just... <laughs> Where, for those again, for those not watching, uh, uh, Peter goes in to, uh, to to J Jonah's office and and uh, J Jonah uh, asks him to go shoot this uh, gala event, and uh, and he, you know, Peter goes, "Can you pay me in advance?" And Jonah proceeds to laugh and then stop and then laugh some more. It's terrific. Yep. So yeah, Doc Ock's one of the best parts of this movie. He's um, Alfred Molina gives a, a a stirring performance here and adds pathos to this character in a way that I don't think anybody was expecting going in. Because Doc Ock, even if you like Doc Ock, okay, he usually wasn't presented in the in the comics with anywhere near this level of no. Depth. No, he's he's more of a you know he is one of those people who delights in his misdeeds at times, and this is this is not 
you know, this is definitely not that. This is a, a more conflicted, um, sympathetic version of the character that, yeah, that I actually really gradually enjoy. and gradually getting turned crazier and crazier by these uh, artificial. One thing I want to devices of his creation. I want to praise right here is you know a lot, we've talked about the CGI a lot. The CGI on the arms actually always looks great, even tremendous. Now. Like yeah. it still looks really good. So, and even a little scary, the noises they make and stuff like that. Like mm-hmm. every time that he does something or says something that doesn't go along with what the arms want to do, their reaction is kind of scary. Like it's like this this kind of tense moment where. It's like, okay, things are changing, and now you can see them starting to exercise more and more control over his psyche. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of an interesting uh, concept, too, of the creator. Cre- you know, we, we, we're used to the you know the Frankenstein thing where the, the creator is undone by his own creation. But we're not used to the creator creating something that then corrupts him mm-hmm. and, and kind of controls him. So that's a, that's a pretty interesting aspect. And... Uh, creates a, a one of the best villains probably in a superhero movie for me for my money anyway. I'm, I'm a, still to this day a huge fan of this version of Doc Ock. Uh, the complexity, the, uh, the the effects, uh, the way that they realized the arms in a way that made it look cool and menacing. Um, really good stuff here. Yeah, I would agree. Is that okay? Is this this is Joel McHale? Right? Yeah, it is. My God, this what movie, a great cameo! The movie is just packed with these <laughs> that, people who that may, n- stars. may not have been cameos at the time, you know, but right. kind of are in hindsight. In hindsight, yeah, Joel McHale would go on to get to some great level of fame, and here he's just a loan officer who gets kicked by Aunt May. Right. Um. But yeah, so poor Peter, he's just you know his grandmother's about to get evicted, or his, I'm sorry, his aunt, not his grandmother, his aunt who. Is older than his grandmother, probably. Uh, uh, is about to get evicted. Well, not evicted. She's trying to refinance her house, and he denies well, her. Well, yeah. And he's like, well, at least I get the free toaster. And he, she doesn't get that either, because she's she old doesn't and doesn't either. understand that nothing is free in life. And she's gullible and can't read fine print. That, that seems to be the joke here. And the back was wearing a Vince McMahon suit as he walked down the steps. Uh and here's going to be our first uh, action scene with uh, with Doc Ock and Pete. So, um, <laughs> oh, the poor Aunt May. I, I felt so bad for Aunt May in the scene when she says, don't leave me. <laughs> and Peter just runs away, and they never address oh. it again. Like, like <laughs> I feel like that's yeah. something Aunt May would have probably got back around to at some point. Yeah. But like, hey, what the hell, Peter, man? Peter, are you that much of a coward? <laughs> again. Uh. I think, and and I, I wish we had Russell on this episode. I'd love to get his take on this because I've always I read between the lines and kind of assumed that she she kind of I think she kind of has figured it out at this point. Maybe also, I'm wrong. apparently, Maybe I'm this is a bank too a, much credit, but a, that I was going to say apparently what? this is a bank dealing exclusively in a uh, 1780s or you know 1780s pirate currency of gold coins being thrown all over the place. Bullion. Yes. And here uh, Peter's having a lot of trouble getting it up in this scene. Yes, he is. But yes, uh, so we <laughs> Aunt Aunt May is, is uh, she's kind of a hidden treasure in this movie. Nick, I have to say I, I don't remember her much in these movies at all. As far as like making a big impression on me, but I was actually really impressed by her performance here and kind of some of the subtle lines that she gets here and and the uh, the uh, subtle shade she gets to throw a couple of times in this movie. Uh, mm-hmm. I really I really enjoy Aunt May here. What do you make of the? Uh, uh, I, I, gosh, I always forget this actress's name. She's such a Rosemary she's Harris. A great, Rosemary Harris. She's a she's a, she's a really terrific actress and. Yeah, she does really good. I mean, this is this is definitely the more traditional take on Aunt May, where her, her her the exclusive like point of her character is to be old and deliver sage old person advice with an occasional like cutting comment in there, and then she does mm-hmm. a a very good job of that. Even though it isn't necessarily the version of Aunt May that I am most attached to, as you know, but still a really good yes. really good job of, of of doing this. This is uh th- this is the the classic Aunt May, and she's she's so good here. Uh, doing this and they give her a little bit of agency in this one too because as in this scene in particular 
she's the one that actually uh, saves Peter as opposed to the other way around. Mm -hmm. He saves her several times, don't get me wrong. But she gives a a well-timed whack to the noggin of Doc Ock. If that uh, had been the Amazing Spider-Man 2, it would have broken her neck just now. That's true. That's true. Now let me ask you this. Oh, there's Stan. There's Stan. Blink and you'll miss it cameo. Maybe his shortest cameo in any of these movies, right? Or the quickest, anyway. I would think so, yeah. What were you going to ask me? Uh, now, she was hanging there, but now when we see a se- in a second, we're going to see that she actually has clear footing right underneath her, which is kind of funny. Too. I don't think she realized that, though, at the time. was what they were going Yeah, for. no, she clearly didn't. She just drops down to it. But um, this is uh, – now, see, this scene looks a little, you know – uh, CGI-ish. It is. Obviously. It does, but I, I like the but, visual there of, of Spider-Man oh, tangled yeah. up in the arms and stuff. Like it's and and one thing about all the fights in this movie, I don't know if I don't know who choreographed them or storyboarded them or if Raimi did that himself, but they're all of the fights in this movie are just brilliantly storyboarded. Like mm-hmm. whether the, whether they're CGI fights or more practical fights, the, they tell stories, they make sense, they serve the story of the movie. They're there, there, are, there are challenges to be overcome within the fight. I think that this is the this movie is the a one example of how to take a comic book character and his action scenes and convert them into a movie and in a way that establishes exactly what makes that hero different. These aren't just martial arts fights. These aren't just generic action fights. Shame These on are you. fights that she has to say it. Yes. These are fights that only Spider-Man can have, you mm-hmm. know? There's webs, there's acrobatics, there's flying around. He's not standing there and just slugging it out with Doc Ock. He has to come up with angles, create ways to get advantages over Doc Ock and his advantages. That was a unique shot. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, Yeah, th- it's just a remarkably well done movie from an action standpoint. And how well it holds up also uh, surprised me to a degree. Um, the uh, the level of I think thought that goes into these fights is better than it gets credit for, and you know we, we'll talk about the probably the most iconic action sequence from this movie and one of the most of all time, which is the train sequence. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, I, I just think the action in this movie in general is really well done. Yeah, I would agree. Um, you know that sequence there. Uh... You know the the closing action sequence isn't that great, but that's just because I think that the that sequence that we just saw and as you referenced the train sequence overshadow it so much that it um it probably just feels less than comparatively. But yeah, that train sequence is just it it still holds up so well. Um, and you know honestly, for a guy who doesn't really have a reputation as being a great director of action to this point, I think Raimi in all three of these movies gave us. Good action scenes in every one of them, um, which is remarkable. Yeah, and you know whether it was even even the scene where uh, where Peter is just going through saving people, right? You know, whether it be the road chase or whatever, mm-hmm. they are really really well done uh, action sequences. And right now we're going to take a diversion because Harry is. <laughs> I can't tell you how excited I was to watch this movie, Nick, and to see a good Harry Osborn again. Because I feel like, honestly, like Franco didn't really get appreciated in, in at the time because you know no one could have known how bad the next time we'd see Harry Osborn would be. Yeah, that's, that's, that's why I was kind of wondering. Like, what are you, your, your only comparison? I guess is Dane DeHaan, which is yeah, you know, <laughs> unfair at best. I would I would say, um, but. His, his Harry Osborn was horrendous. Oh, it uh, was like, but no one, you know, <laughs> could have made that. But good. this, but this was this reminded me that that Harry, I think for me, was always one of my favorite characters in these movies because I think they did. I think Raimi does a good job of capturing the arc of Harry Osborn, which they missed so completely in the Amazing movies. Well, particularly Amazing Two, the only one that he was in. Yeah, uh, Harry only works as a character if. He has that relationship with Peter to start with, right? If he doesn't, the character completely is useless. There's no point to him, right? He's just another character with daddy issues. Otherwise, I, I agree wholeheartedly, um, which is why I'm kind of hoping they'll introduce him in an amazing spider, or excuse me, in a, in a homecoming sequel, and just have them be friends for a little while. You know? No, he'll have to be fat if they do that. Not necessarily. 
I think they should just make the Ned Leeds kid the, the new Harry. Why not? Well, you kind of need the Norman thing there. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Basketball here. That's the other thing. This movie does not, at no point in these movies, Nick, in this one, in the first one, or even in the third one, do we see basketball here. And I want to know why. <laughs> because no one has that hair, Greg. It is a thing that was drawn in the comics and, like, <laughs> you know, it's the same reason that nobody has Rob Liefeld Captain America tits. They just aren't re- they aren't things that exist. You're telling me, you're telling me it's 2018. Man has walked on the moon, for God's sake, Nick. Man has walked on the moon and we can't come up with basketball hair in a movie? It's just not a thing, Greg. I can't, I can't explain that to you any more than that. It's like there is no real life equivalent that someone could could look at to build that. You know. I okay. I've got an idea of where you can start with Hollywood scientists. If you're listening to, the, if any, if any Hollywood scientists are listening to this podcast right now, I want you to go back and I want you to watch footage of Jerry Lee Lewis, the killer. <laughs> Performing around 1958, 59. That's look not at his basketball hair. hair. No, but look at his hair. Look at the waviness. It's the closest approximation. And I want you to find a way well, to help that. Franco's hair Turn here is pretty wavy. Up. I mean, what are you wanting? What are I you... mean, it's wavy, but it's it's Franco here. It's that, oh, I'm James Franco. Look at me hair. You know, it's different. I would also argue that to most people, the basketball hair isn't nearly as essential to the character as it is to you. <laughs> To me, listen. If I'm defining Harry Osborne's characteristics, I'm saying number one, uh, 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 awkward, uh, uh, awkward Man, this uh, is, daddy issues. This is a very aggressive no, version of Harry here. Yes, he is. Number two, uh, uh, self-deprecating and, and, and lacking in, in real confidence, even though he has outward confidence at times. And number three, basketball hair. Basketball, it's essential to his character. Basketball hair. There's John Jameson, the famous astronaut. You will be glad to know that in the uh, Renew Your Vows uh, series, the alternate future series, um, his his son Normie continues the tradition of basketball here. Even in <laughs> Normie, even in I remember Normie, even in 2024, he continues the tradition of basketball here. This I, we haven't even talked about this amazing this whole gala or gala or gala or however you pronounce it, rich people party is. <laughs> Awesome, because, or maybe this is later in the movie, this time. No, I think this was this one. Peter, every time he tries to get one of the free items of food at yes. these things, he, somebody else it takes, never works. Somebody, somebody else, else takes it. Takes the last then he one. finally, at, at the end, he finally gets a free drink from one of these things, and he goes to drink it, and there's nothing in the glass. Yes. <laughs> just, just an umbrella. Oh, oh. tremendous. Tremendous. So, um, good old, uh, good old, uh, Pete, his powers are failing him. So that's one of the subplots in this movie is the, the power failure, which I have to admit, over the years, this is one aspect of the movie that I've never quite wrapped my head around. It's is it just a self-confidence issue or rather a, a divided focuses issue? Yeah, I think it's a combination of the two. His his con- his inner conflict call- causing himself to, you know, because he's so conflicted about what he should be doing at any given point, he feels like he's not really serving any particular area of his life to his right. fullest and it causes an issue of self-confidence. Um, and honestly, you know, for a movie that is kind of, you know, it's already at two hours, like we said, like we said earlier, and it has that John Jameson character that doesn't really develop. I don't really think the power failure subplot was necessary, honestly. Like, I think you can get across that question of whether he should be Spider-Man just through his relationship with MJ instead of having to have a physical manifestation of it. I'm not saying I don't like it. I'm just saying one of the things I'm looking back at and kind of going, does this really, does it? Does it serve any greater purpose than what you're already setting up here? You know. Yeah, I think, I think for me the big thing was always it, it's a little. It works, and I think it's out of the comics as well. I think they did something similar yeah. in comics back in the day, but I, I think for me it's like, I'm kind of like you on that. It, it doesn't, uh, you know. Certainly, I could I couldn't make it better. I, I'm not I'm not suggesting that this could be better done a different way. I'm just saying that you know that's kind of an aspect of the movie that I've never really cared about that much at the time when i was watching it i remember thinking it was leading somewhere like yeah he's losing his powers or something but uh it's kind of uh uh, you know and here's this a manifestation of here's his hippie doctor who wears tie-dye shirts under his lab coat 
and sits next to Peter on the uh, on the on the patient's bed. If a doctor ever sat next to me when I was in my underwear, I would I would be very concerned. It would be it would be on the level of a southern preacher in terms of the creepiness factor. How y'all doing? Welcome to service today. We're glad you can make it. As I rub your shoulder for thirty seconds. Yeah. Also, <laughs> I have to say, which man, it could be worse. I suppose there are other other certain faiths that have worse reputations when it comes to physical contact. That's true. Is it? Uh, <laughs> maybe it's just different in New York, but I've never been to a doctor's office that had a giant skeleton in it either. When I was a kid, like. They had one in the in the like doctor's off like the building, but not necessarily in the examination rooms. That would be off putting to me. I wouldn't want to be getting a rectal exam and looking at a skeleton while it's happening. Why are you getting a rectal you know? exam? You well, know? hey. What else am I gonna do on a Tuesday? <laughs> anything else? Virtually anything else? Well, when the options are here, we are with Peter engaging one of his, his favorite uh, pastimes, which is staring into space. Oh, we—that's uh, the other thing. This this scene, I love. I oh, this is great, love, yeah. and I didn't remember it at all. Yeah. I didn't remember this at all. I didn't remember Uncle Ben being in this movie. This is great. Yes, he's in all three of them. Actually, I believe he pops up in Spider Man Three as well, and this kind of. I don't even know what this is supposed to be, but, you know, this idealized version of, of his car right before his death, I guess, where he and right. Peter have these conversations. Um, mm -hmm. it's, all, it's all going on in Peter's mind, you know, as mm -hmm. he's uh, kind of wrestling with his, can I have, a, am I allowed to have a life at this point? You know, yeah. it's kind of the, the question that he's that he's asking. And um, it's very... At this point, I Peter like, you said that already. You said it multiple times. You said it over and over again. I got the point. For God's sake, just let it go. <laughs> You're when beating it into the, pant, the into the ground. When he reaches out and, and 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 Peter refuses to take his hand, I mean, this is just a heartbreaking scene that is carried by the performance of uh, of both guys, actually. Mm -hmm. But but Toby in particular is, I mean, this is great acting here from Toby. Indeed, it is. Toby I mean, being Toby McGuire, who I don't know if we've actually mentioned, yes. who plays Spider Man in this movie. And you've got, I believe, Oscar <laughs> Robertson as uh, as yes. as Uncle Ben. And also, Oscar Robertson was an incredible basketball player in his day. I think the Big O they called him. Wasn't that Oscar Robinson? No, it was Robertson. Was it? Yeah, I'll take your word for it. Uh, uh, you are thinking of the Admiral David Robinson. I don't necessarily know that I was thinking of that, but fair enough. You were thinking of Mario Eli, Cliff Robertson, not Oscar Robertson. My mistake, Cliff. Yeah, there you Mario are, Mario Eli. Former wing player for the Houston Rockets and San Antonio Spurs, and here he just throws his, his costume into the trash casually, yep. which I understand is, is trying to homage the comics and whatnot. But it's not trying to homage; it is it is directly homage. right. I just I, I, I wonder Perhaps. if that's if that's not the smartest you know usage of just wouldn't you rather just keep it in your room or whatever? I don't just know. in case you decided to use it later. Yeah. yeah, or just in case you didn't want people to know that Spider Man was was gone. The uh, uh, and here is Sam so, Raimi's, uh, you know, something they'll they'll do again right, later in Spider in Spider Man Three. He loves these music these musical montages of yep. Peter doing things. Raindrops keep falling on my head. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, uh, uh, the, the that for again for those that may not uh, have followed what we were talking about, there was just an homage to one of the most famous Spider Man stories of all time, mm -hmm. uh, Spider Man No More. Mm -hmm. Where, where he decides that he's no longer going to be uh, Spider-Man in the wake of, <laughs> of all the guilt that he's dealing with. Uh, this is good, too. Trying to fix a bike. You punk. Man, now that... I will, I will, I will say this, Nick. If we're, if we're playing fantasy director, how do you not cast Arnold for that role as the guy that yells up at Peter in his balcony? <laughs> Something tells me, you, you know, punk, Arnold was a little busy. Bastard. Was a little busy at the time. <laughs> You son of a bitch! What are you doing, you fuck? Yeah, something like that. Here's what I want to know: the implication from their earlier conversation was, how was Peter already not flunked out of college by this point? Like, the implication was he He's hadn't done anything. Smart. Yeah, but you still have to turn assignments in, based on my understanding of how non-journalism majors work, anyway. Uh, you know, you know, there were there were lit classes I'd show up 
to every time as I was the I was the uh, the attentive student, and there'd be a guy that would show up, you know, three times a semester, and he managed to somehow make it through. You know, as we've discussed previously, I think the way to improve this play that Mary Jane is in is rather than having it be the being the importance of being. Ernest, E A R N E S T. Right. I think it should be the importance yep. of being earnest, E R N E S T. And Jim yes. Barney plays her co star here rather than this vaguely British guy they have. I, I have no idea what the importance of being earnest is about. But no, nor do much, I. It would be much more interesting. I know this for a fact if it were about the importance of being earnest, P. World. Yes, the importance uh, of being earnest, P. World. That, now, that would be tremendous, and that would be a play that I would be mad at Peter for not. How can you blame Peter for not showing up to this, in all honesty? Yeah, now I mean, I, if it had been the, the importance of Ernest P. Worrell, yes, but, you know, yeah, I can kind of understand yeah. him not showing up to this play as it... Yeah, I wouldn't show up to this play. I, I'll be If you were in this play, Nick, I probably wouldn't show up to it, I'm just going to tell you. You know, if I were in this play, I would hope you would show up and murder me. That would be my <laughs> my, my <laughs> most sincere hope. <laughs> and, I, I, you know, I can't help but notice that in these scenes, not once is the name Ernest even muttered, so I don't even understand. Yeah, I don't, I don't... Yeah, this is kind of... This is, this is really dumb. I don't get it. Oh, God Almighty! Remember the Ernest off, the Earn off, if you will. Yeah, the uh, like, yeah, where Saves Christmas was was victorious. Yeah, that, no, where where it goes to jail was declared the greatest Ernest movie. No, I think it was Saves Christmas. Uh, the uh, that may that Ernest off could perhaps make a future countdown <laughs> list that we put together. <laughs> We are approaching. I think next week is our one hundredth episode. So we we're going to be rather self indulgent next week and talk about how great we are. Oh yes, ain't we great? Ain't we great? The answer, eh, we're all right. Yeah, that's <laughs> all right. <laughs> Andrew Gardner will be our guest star. Yeah. He'll tell us how great we are. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gardner, what did you think about episode sixty-one? <laughs> eh, about the same as the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> there was some stuff I didn't really understand the jokes, and you guys talked about wrestling and and you know nineties country music and. Clint Black. Oh. Clint Black. <laughs> Definitely the worst episode was the, the first one in which you mentioned Clint Black. Yeah, Clint Black, yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, God. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so what else? What, what haven't we talked about in this film? We talked about... Uh, we talked about MJ. Players. We talked about uh, Toby. We talked about... You know, we haven't really talked about Toby, though. No, we haven't really much. talked about Toby. Except well, we've kind of gotten with, into uh, Franco and uh, and MJ and Aunt May and, and Melina, but we haven't really... And JK, yeah. of course, but we haven't really talked about Toby that much. I know right. that was something you wanted to talk a little bit more about. Um, yes, we, ha- we we talked about him in the scene with the rice maker, but we haven't talked about uh, any other aspect of him. The rice and, maker? And Uncle Ben. Oh, yeah. He makes great rice. They want you to believe that in 2004, they were still literally pasting pieces of paper to design a cover. Pasting the papers together? <laughs> yeah, I noticed that too. <laughs> I was watching the back. I love, I love, I love movie journalism. Yes, it is so, like, you know, movie journalism sets this unrealistic expectation. You know one of the movies that I blame the most for having an unrealistic expectation of what the what the actual news life was going to be, Greg? Zodiac. Because in Zodiac, yeah. all Robert Downey Jr. does is drink and say sarcastic things and smoke openly in his office. It looked like my own personal version of heaven. And then I got into the business and it was far, far different than that. Yes, Lo- whether Lois and Clark or, or Spider-Man or, or, or uh, uh, all the presidents, men, every movie about journalism makes journalism look so glamorous. And, it, and then you get into journalism and you realize that it's mostly just sitting at your desk waiting for the phone to ring. And, be, and living at the poverty level. And living at the poverty level, yes. Most importantly, living at the poverty level. Not at, not below the level, but just right there at just it. Just right at it. Just enough above it to not qualify for any breaks. Yes. So, yeah. And, what is and, up with this Asian violin lady they keep coming back to, by the way? And what and what about what about how in the movies journalists get to travel internationally to cover stories? <laughs> Lois Lane gets sent to Antarctica to come to discover the Fortress of Solitude and Man of Steel. Like what? <laughs> I, I was lucky to get mileage to Geneva. Do you mean Geneva? Geneva. That's Lois Lane point. shows up in Africa undercover in, in Batman v Superman. <laughs> Not saying it doesn't happen, but come on, you know let's. Yeah, and we we and we've been over Daredevil and its version of journalism too, where the editor just <laughs> never expects a story to be turned in. <laughs> <laughs> Have 
haven't seen a byline in six weeks. What are you working on? <laughs> oh, I'm still letting this one marinate a little bit. Oh, all right then. Not you know the what? way it works. You know what? I'm going to back you on that. I'm, I'm going to back, back you on that. Play. I have faith that when you're truly ready to write a story, you'll have a story. In the meantime, we'll just run something else. <laughs> And when we do run your story, it's a it's an opinion column. Yes, on the front page. In a year, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, we actually do have a point about the movie I want to make though. So that scene at the grave was it not amazing how much they made uh, Toby Maguire in that scene at the grave look like Steve Ditko's Peter Parker? Uh, yeah, I guess. I, <laughs> well, you kind of caught me off guard with that one. Yeah, well, the, I, it just struck me when I was watching it again today. That shot of like, oh, the tie hair, like, and the glasses and all that. The yeah, tie yeah, and the glasses and the hair kind of going up. Yeah, they had to show him again for me to be able to actually see it. You know, because yeah. we, we had gotten past. Um, it. And now it's in the. Uh, now it's. I, I didn't want to interrupt. You were on a roll with the the journalism. The no, journalism it's fine. Right, so. This scene is really weird to me, um, and one of the reasons it's weird is because this section of the movie, I think the point is kind of supposed to be that Peter's life appears to be a little bit better without Spider-Man. And this one feels like a random, like, wait a minute, stuff still sucks. You know, it's it's a it's a weird... It's not a bad scene, and I, I understand that it, it's kind of necessary given that they, they are referencing, they kind of allude to this possibly happening in an earlier scene, but it, it feels like the well, only part of the sequence of the movie that kind of loses the central theme well, a little bit. Here, here, here's where I think you're, you're wrong about that, because I think this is... This is the the next wave of things going badly for Peter because we also just saw uh, him see a guy getting mugged and turn his back to the guy and walk off Mm -hmm. and kind of, you could see his kind of inner turmoil at that. And I think that's why this scene makes sense because they transition from that to uncle Ben's grave. And suddenly the guilt that Peter has of walking away from a situation not unlike what he walked away from when Uncle Ben. Yeah, died. I suppose I suppose this is a good point. I just always took it as ultimately the thing that drove him back was his, you know, responsibility to Mary Jane, and this kind of felt more ancillary than that primary motivation, I guess. Sure. Yeah. I I, I just love this scene because again, it's a chance to see another heartbreaking scene where Peter recoils from Uncle Ben's hand in his head. Mm-hmm. And now here at the table, he reaches out to Aunt May, and she recruits right. her Right, that's a good point. That's a good, good parallelism, parallelism uh, there. So, so yeah. So, and you, we brought up Toby. So, I guess I should go ahead and, and get into him a little bit here. Oh, oh. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> my boy. Uh, so I, I love that Toby because over over the years, I've kind of undersold Toby McGuire a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know you have a bit of a bone to pick with. General perception, so I'm going to let you talk for a little bit. Mm-hmm. I know you have a bit of a bone to pick with the general modern-day yes. perception of Tobey Maguire, so I'm going to let you, yes. let you the, go for the a little modern, bit. The modern perception, because we, let's face it, we live in a, in a, in a cult, pop culture world where we're slaves to the moment. Whatever happens now is better than what happened before or worse than what happened before. There's no in-between, there's no in-the-middle, there's no... Uh, and we've talked about this in the past with the Joker performances, with Batman performances, with whatever it may be. And I think the perception um, of Tobey Maguire has been lessened somewhat since these movies came out. Because I don't remember people complaining about Tobey in 2004, after the first two movies. I feel like the combination of Spider-Man 3's failure and the combination of getting a more comedic take on Spider-Man, uh, particularly in Spider-Man Homecoming, that everybody's excited about after the dreadful Amazing Spider-Man 2. Um, I think it has kind of shaped the perception that Tobey Maguire was never really Spider-Man to begin with, that he was playing some different character and wasn't really inhabiting the role of Spider-Man. And I think it's fair to say that the Sam Raimi movies did not have the punchline spewing Spider-Man like perhaps you would expect to see. But what I noticed watching this movie is, to me, Tobey Maguire absolutely inhabits the character that I read as a kid. Um, It's not the Spider-Man of the swinging 60s, necessarily. It's not the... And he does have some punchlines in this one. He has a couple of funny lines in this movie. 
but it's not that constant barrage that you might expect from the cartoon or from you know from some of the comics necessarily. But the character that I read in the comics when I was a kid, the kind of conflicted, tortured character that had really bad luck as Peter and enjoyed being Spider Man, I do get that sense here. I see I sense a guy and I see a guy that lets loose when he's Spider Man and is able to have a little bit of fun and a guy who is constantly at odds with himself for trying to do the right thing as Peter Parker. And I can't pick any holes in his acting in this movie. I think he acts the hell out of this one and actually shows genuine and real emotion throughout the entirety of the movie as I get a barrage of text messages. Um, And uh, I think that he inhabits this role and portrays it, to me, the best of anyone. Tom Holland was great in Spider-Man Homecoming, and I have high hopes for him going forward, but I haven't yet seen him make me feel anything the way that Toby does in at least three scenes in this movie. And those that would be the, the Uncle Ben scene, the Aunt May scene at the table, and the MJ scene at the end. Mm-hmm. I feel like Toby is awesome in this one. He's underrated historically for his Spider-Man performance. It's not like it's not a it's not a, a Heath Ledger, it's not even an Alfred Molina kind of like transcendent performance. But what he does is he plays this character and he makes me feel like I'm watching Spider-Man that I read when I was a kid. That's something Andrew Garfield never did, and that's something that Tom Holland has done, but hasn't had a chance to sink his teeth into yet to the emotional level that Toby does. So Holland's able to be a little bit funnier, a little goofier, but Toby was really emotional and really made me believe that I was watching a real person on the screen. And I think that's a big compliment to Pam. So I was actually very impressed with Toby on this rewatch. Yeah, Toby does a great job. I'm not. I'm not going to disagree with you there. I think. I think what, where we kind of venture, you know, diverge from each other a little bit is Toby does a great job with the version of the character that is written for him here. But the version of the character they're writing here, while it has a lot of, it checks a lot of the boxes. It doesn't check enough of the boxes for me to be considered the best Spider-Man. Like, you know, you've got the emotion down pat for sure. And like you said, they really lean into that whole like. Everything in this guy's life is kind of going badly, and while that is certainly an element of Spider-Man, I'm not I'm not arguing that isn't an element of Peter Parker. I feel like that's the only area of Peter Parker they really have any interest in, in exploring here, and there is more to him than just constant misery. You know, his unwavering optimism in the in the shadow of that of that um, of that tragedy is certainly part of his character, and they never got the quippy like. You know, you, you talk about how here in these movies you get to see him let loose a little bit with Spider-Man. He never got to let loose enough. Like, their version of the of him in the suit always felt a little bit more restrained from a dialogue perspective than either of the two respective versions of Spider-Man we've seen since then in both Andrew Garfield and um, Tom Holland. I mean, if we're comparing him to the other ones, I think ultimately he's probably a little bit better than Garfield, I guess. Even though I think Garfield's version of Spider-Man is better than than Toby's, and Toby probably gets the nod in the Peter Parker respect, but I think Tom Holland checks more of the boxes for me in terms of what I'm looking for than Toby does. So I would I would give the nod to Tom Holland uh, based on his two appearances thus far in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That's fair enough. Um, I think that Spider-Man Two is a movie that almost would feel weird if it embraced that totality of Spider-Man because of the place where he is in his life. I think you could argue the first movie certainly could have had more uh, comedy Peter in it. I, don't, I just don't know how it would have worked in a movie where Peter is this at odds with himself. Yeah, but the idea is that he's, you know, that Spider-Man is his outlet. And so all these bad things are happening in his personal life and he, you know, that only causes him to be more irreverent while, while in costume. He has to have an outlet for those things and that's kind of the always... The way I viewed it, and, and one of the areas, one of the only areas of this franchise that I felt like just completely missed the mark in that regard. They just didn't seem that interested in Peter saying much of anything while in costume, or at least not anything entertaining, you know? Right. So, we haven't yet talked about the, uh, the subway scene, or not the subway scene, the train, train scene. scene. Yeah. Now, arguably, the, I don't know, would you say probably the most famous scene in this movie? I would think without question, right? Yeah, I mean, I would think so. Didn't know if you had any other suggestions for that, but um, the 
holds up amazingly well. I mean, it made my list of the best superhero fight scenes that we've seen. Um, just incredible CGI that holds up. Uh, practical effects that hold up, of course, because they're practical effects. And telling a story of right. heroism that is unlike anything we had seen to that point. Yeah, even even more so than the act than the fighting itself. Like I'm, I don't think the you know the the punches that are being thrown and, and him and Doc Ock doing battle is necessarily you know all that groundbreaking. It's it's cool to look at. Don't be wrong, but the, the the story being told in that action sequence is just remarkable. I mean, it yeah. is not simply action for action's sake. It is a remarkable job of, of telling this uh, of telling this story of heroism. I agree with you there. Would would it be fair to say that the scene? It's an example of the scene picking a body part and telling a story. In that case, the body part being your heart. Oh. <laughs> well, I can't think of any better way to, to start winding this thing down than with that line. Uh, a truly heart-wrenching line from one Mr. Nick Duke. Now, this uh, the first thing I'm going to do is sing now a few more times. <laughs> and then the second thing I'm going to do is... Talk about final thoughts on this one. We've, we've talked. Yeah. About, I feel like all the main players we talked about at this point. Uh, the plot's great. It makes you know. It's it's a really interesting story of Peter sh- trying to come to terms with who he is and whether he can have a life while there's this Doc Ock storyline going on that is very compelling. That is interesting about this this good man driven mad, <clears throat> and you've got subplots with Harry. Which I we haven't really touched on how that ends up here, but talk about a freaking missed opportunity, man! The ending of this movie is so good. Yes. The, the way that they, the whole the, the whole wind down the climax and then uh, the, the kind of uh, epilogue, if you will, is so good. And I'm like, oh shit! Not only does MJ know he's Peter Parker now, they're going to try to have a relationship, but now Harry knows. And Harry still thinks his dad got murdered for no reason, and now Harry's going to become the Green Goblin. I was so stoked at the end of this movie, Nick. I thought Spider-Man 3 would be can't miss. I did too, and they overthought it from the beginning with the forced inclusion of Venom, and then like rather than just having him be the Green Goblin and truly carry on in his father's footsteps, they went with that bizarre like new Goblin look, which was just awful. Like, mm-hmm. felt very 2000s, like trying to speak to some sort of, you know, and even at that point, a, a fad that was dying out, trying to speak to the extreme sports fad or something with the snowboard yeah. look and all that. It's just a, you know, we're not here to re- relitigate the failures of Spider-Man 3, but I'll agree with you. No. Um, but the the issues with Spider-Man 3 could not be foreseen at the close of this movie. Right. It, 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 this one seems to be, not, this is a, this is a, 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 a pre, a rare pre-MCU example of a great standalone superhero movie that also ends in such a way that it could set up a franchise of great movies. Mm -hmm. Follow. There's no sense of a slowdown. I don't think at the end of this movie uh, or a sense of finality, there is a sense of, I can't wait to see where this goes next. And it's uh, another, another notch in this, in this movie's column. So we said we were going to have a bit of a love fest for this one, Nick. I don't think there's any surprises. We, I think, you know, we have a couple of little issues here and there with the movie, mm-hmm. uh, respectively. Um, but uh, you, you perhaps a few more than, than me, but I think overall both of us love this one. Right? Oh, yeah, no doubt. Um, holds up very well. Yeah, absolutely holds up very well. Um, you know, I think where we disagree, I guess, if, if we want to have that conversation, is where it falls in the overall Spider-Man pantheon because yes. I think the primary difference between you and I is – there have been six Spider-Man movies made to this point, and four of them I think are I, – I love or at least very much enjoy. And then I think there's one that is a little bit below average, and then I think there's one that is a train wreck of – a du- excuse me, a dumpster fire of Poolian proportions. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, we really got a podcast happen. Yes, we do. But like, uh, but, but yeah, that, that's the difference, think, primary difference between you and I is like, I think there have been two, I think there have been one great Spider-Man movie, one really, really good Spider-Man movie, one good Spider-Man movie, and then, you know, a, a, a kind of a mishmash of average movies, and then a, you know, like you, a, just an atrociously bad one. Yeah. Um, so let, you know, I, I, we're not here to rank all the Spider-Man movies unless you want to. 
That's up to uh, you. We'd have you, to, you know, we'd you... probably have to rewatch them in order to do that. No, I mean, I've, I have rewatched Spider-Man 2 and 3 in recent memory and Homecoming, for that matter. The only ones I haven't rewatched recently are the first Spider-Man and the two Amazings. But I have my Spider-Man movie franchise ranking pretty pretty well set in my mind, if that's something you, you want to engage in. We could, well, I guess we could revisit it in the future whenever we do uh, some of these other ones. But I guess if, I, if I'm going off the top of my head, mm-hmm. I think, and this is probably going to be a diversion from us as well, but... I think it's number one Spider-Man 2, the one we just watched, Mm -hmm. and I don't think it's even close. Uh, I think it's far leagues ahead of number two, which would be Homecoming, and then I think Homecoming is just a little bit ahead of the original Spider-Man, and then I think that is leagues ahead of uh, Spider-Man 3, and then the Amazing Mm. Spider-Man, and then somewhere in the subterranean level would be... uh, Amazing Spider-Man 2. Yeah, and see, that's the primary source of disagreement for us in these rankings is I'm much higher on the first Amazing Spider-Man than you are, mainly because it speaks to an interpretation of the character that I have a a very deep emotional attachment to. So for me, I would go Homecoming number one, and then I have to make a real, like, difficult choice between this, between Spider-Man 2 and the Amazing Spider-Man in terms of which one I prefer. You know, objectively, this one's probably better, but... I just I there is a emotional connection I feel to that a first Amazing Spider-Man movie that I can't deny, so I'd probably give that the slight nod, then this one, then uh, the first Spider-Man, and then Spider-Man three, and then Homecoming or excuse me, Sp- Amazing Spider-Man two. I, I God, I don't even know how far behind the other ones, but like the gap between Spider-Man three and the Amazing Spider-Man two is like one of the largest gaps between comparable things that I can come up with. Yeah, I would agree on I would agree with you on that. Uh, so, <clears throat> with all that being said, we want to hear your Spider Man movie rankings, your memories of watching Spider Man Two at the theater on home video. Uh, what kind of impact did this movie have on you as a fan? Uh, let us know. Tweet us at Jr's Bar- BBQ. Uh, tweet us at G Phillips eight six five two at Nick Duke eighty seven. Join the Place to Be Nation Comics Facebook page. Just go to Facebook.com, type in Place to Be Nation Comics, join the group. We'll let you in. We'll have great conversation and discussion there. Uh, you can email us, as I mentioned earlier, Greg P at Place to Be Nation.com, Nick D at Place to Be Nation.com. And please give us your feedback on this or any other topic you want to talk about. We will talk about it on the show. If you interact with us, we will uh, we will bring that up and, and implement in, any changes. In honor of, of Big Show number 100 coming up next week, let us know your favorite moments in hard-traveling fanboy history. That's right. Do you have a particular favorite episode that stands out in the longest-running running weekly, weekly episodic, episodic comic, comic book, book podcast, podcast in, in all the place, place to be nation. nation? Good Lord, Greg. What are you doing there? I think my connection must have been messing up because I was I was perfectly in rhythm with myself. <laughs> but <clears throat> nonetheless, connection issues aside, in the L-shaped studio where we both are, mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, uh, yes, we would love to hear your favorite uh, HTF episodes, your favorite HTF topics, favorite HTF rants, basically things to make us know that you're longtime listeners and Make us feel good about ourselves. <laughs> yes, we would. We would appreciate some, you know, not not at all forced and begged for pats on the back. Yes, verbal fellatio, very <laughs> much encouraged. Yes, in fact, any type of fellatio, very much encouraged. Well, yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. With that said, we're going to take a little break here, folks. And when we come back from the other side, we urge you, we urge you, to stick with us as we. Get you the rundown, reading and watching, and maybe a little something else. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hey, pro wrestling announcer Kevin Kelly here. I want to make sure you are all subscribed to all the great feeds here at Place to Be Nation. It's really easy to do. Just head to iTunes or your preferred podcatcher app today and search and subscribe to the Place to Be Nation wrestling feed, which, of course, includes the full archives of The Kevin Kelly Show, the Place to Be Nation pod feed, and the Pro Wrestling Only feed. Subscribe, listen, and then rate us and leave feedback today. And be sure to give Justin your true thoughts. I mean, don't hold back. After all, he is kind of a jerk. Just listen to Scott.
Play Simi Nations, JT Rosero and Chad Campbell here. We want to let you know that we have a ton of great podcasts available to you on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and PlaySimiNation.com, and we offer those to you on three great feeds. On the Place to Be Nation wrestling feed, we bring you the Mothership, the original Place to Be podcast, as well as main event, Lucha Afterground, and our monthly pay-per-view reaction shows, as well as the Our Vantage Point podcast and Jeff Learns Wrestling. In addition to these full-length shows, we also deliver quick-hit pod blasts on topics old and new. Over on the Pro Wrestling Only feed, we dive deep inside the wrestling business with a stacked army of experts leading the way. The feed features potpourri shows such as This Week in Wrestling, Greetings from Allentown, Psychology is Dead, Puro Puri, Stacy and Elliot's Bogus Journey, and the Military Industrial Suplex. We also have shows that focus intently on certain topics like Letters from Center Stage, Space City, and NWA Classics on Demand Adventure, Through the Years, Strong Style History, Strong Style Story, and Mount Olympus. Plus, the feed has the full archives of legendary shows like Titans of Wrestling, Where the Big Boys Play, Letters from Kayfabe, and much more. And on our popular Place to Be Nation Pop podcast feed, we offer such great shows as the Glenn Butler Podcast Hour Spectacular, Rank and File, PTBN Dadcast, Go Home in a Box, NBA Team, and Lucha Undead, as well as a vertible podcast heaven for comics fans with the hard-traveling fanboys, Sellers Points, Todd Weber's Conversation, Geek and Sassy, and Imaginary Stories Podcasts. You can find all these current shows plus archives of our past podcasts, including The Kevin Kelly Show, as well by subscribing to all of our feeds on iTunes. And while there, be sure to rate and leave feedback as well. All of these shows plus others available on PlacementNation.com, where we cover pro wrestling, sports, movies, comics, plus in-depth stretch projects and more. Be sure to support our site by using PlacementNation.com backslash Amazon when shopping online and download our free PTB Vintage Vault Refresh eBooks via the links on our site. We also want to thank our friends at Bonehead's Wing Bar in West Warwick, Rhode Island and Fall River, Massachusetts, TheHistoryWrestling.com and Scott Keats Blog of Doom. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr as well. PlaySimulation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the next half of the Hard Traveling Fanboys show. We like to talk about comic books here, and, you know, one of those things that we like to talk about is a, a little segment, Nick, that features all the news and notes around the comic book world. You know what we like to call that segment, Nick? I do not. I wonder if there would if there could be some sort of musical interlude to inform us what that segment is called. Hmm. That is a good question. Let's let's pitch to the manager to find out more. Welcome to the rundown. Where we talk some comic news. Yes, it is indeed the rundown, Nick. That's that word. Yeah, really. you know, and that that's a great way to introduce that term through a through a jingle. You know, and, and 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 quite frankly, I would suggest that if a show has a jingle, whoever you know, whatever show has that jingle, the people who produce that show need to be grateful to the people who put in hard work and effort into those jingles. You know, you and I are very grateful to Todd, to the manager Todd Weber, and to and to David Sunday for the. Countless hours they put into those fifteen second jingles. You know, it is just absolutely. It is, it is. You know, when you're sitting at home, it it may sound like it took only seconds or minutes to record, but and that's we're wrong. talking about we're talking about months yeah. in the recording studio. Absolutely, absolutely. And all I'm saying is, so if your show has a jingle, if you're a podcast host out there and you've got a jingle, just just be grateful for it. You know, don't don't be ungrateful. Don't be disrespectful. Don't be insolent, as Doctor Evil might say. Oh, uh, Dr. Eagle. He was a funny cat. That doc. Uh, but you know what's not funny, Nick? What's that? Superhero movies. They're serious business. Well, sometimes they're funny. And, and, they're, and they're such serious business, in fact, that Marvel has moved the release date of Avenger, Avengers. Well, I don't. Let me rephrase that. I don't Avengers know. Avengers Infinity War back a week, which has let. Let me finish. Which has led to serious business moves by other studios as they adjust their schedules 
to adjust to Marvel's adjustment. Yeah, I don't know that Marvel necessarily adjusted the date because of it being serious business or something like that. I think that's a, a forced attempt at a transition on your part, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> you, you don't know anything about my transitions. I'll have you know. Greg, I have heard I have heard almost 100 consecutive weeks of your transitions now. I trust me, I know a little bit about your transitions. I went I went to a, I went to a work conference in Atlanta. Yes, you and did. when I was in Atlanta, I went I didn't have to fly anywhere, but I went to the airport anyway. Yeah, just you know what out. people told me at the airport, Nick? Uh, you know. I don't know. What did they tell you? Something about your transitions, I'm assuming. They no, they told me that the uh, Braves were going to be uh, better this year. Than they were. Oh, so the, so the, the staff. Of the, so you're saying that the staff of the Atlanta Journal Constitution was hanging out at the airport? Yes, at the airport. Then I left the airport and outside. Somebody he said, "Hey, love your transition on the longest running weekly episode of Comic Book Podcast on the whole place to be nation." And I said, "Thank you, sir." And he said, "I really love your transitions on Geek and Sassy." And I said, "You bastard! You dirty dog!" <laughs> All right. Turns out, turns out, he thought they were the longest running weekly episodic comic book podcast, and he thought I was a woman. Well, you know, the problem with them is that they're not weekly. You know, they don't. There is nobody right. who can who can challenge for our throne at this point. That's right. They don't know what it's like to sleepwalk their way through weekly podcasts. They don't. Do. They don't. You know, <laughs> it's it, it is a it is both a blessing and a curse to do this. It is. It is. And why do we suffer? For our listeners. That's right. For all seven of our listeners. That's right. So anyway, Avengers Infinity Wars opening a week earlier, Nick, which doesn't really affect us in any real way. No. <laughs> hey, it's exciting, though. I get to see the movie a week sooner. You know, like, that. that's cool. Yeah. yeah. And it gives us a little bit more breathing time, a little bit more space between the Avengers and Deadpool, which I think is appreciated. You know, and that that's the only part of this that I think is even worth discussing. Is it possible that they moved because they were worried about Deadpool? At least on some level. I think, yeah, dividing the audience, perhaps. Right. Because, I mean, uh, per- there's no question it was going to get... It, wouldn't, it be in, wouldn't it be in Marvel's best interest if both movies are highly successful? Well, yeah, but I, I guess I'm looking at it in terms of... Okay, look at look at Black Panther right now. Black Panther has had no competition since it's been released. Right. It's dominating the box yep. office. And undoubtedly, Infinity War was going to dominate the box office for two weeks. But that third week, Deadpool's going to come out, and I think it would have been open number one. And done the lion's share of business, right? Right, yes. This way, Marvel gets to control the box office for another week. And it just, it's interesting me to me because think think back, you know, even five years ago, Greg, after the first Avengers movie, the idea of Deadpool, of all things, being any sort of a financial threat to the Avengers, it was... Was ludicrous. Ludicrous. And now, it's not. And that's just, it's such an interesting, you know, commentary on the way things have played out over the last few years. Absolutely, it's it's com- competition is a good thing, mm-hmm. and competition can lead to controversy. And as you know, Nick, controversy yes makes money. Makes money, it does. That's true. Controversy so, does create money. That's why you you need to stir up artificial drama on social media constantly in an effort to uh, portray a character because it will create money for you. I think that's exactly right. I think it's in your best interest to publicly air dirty laundry whenever possible Yep. Uh, in an attempt to seem cooler than you actually are. Yes, I agree. Uh, so that's also a good thing to do. Yes. Um, now, speaking of uh, things that are relevant to the topic at hand, Marvel also has made some pretty big announcements with their upcoming initiative, their relaunch, of course, their rebranding in, in the coming weeks. The and, fresh uh, start. Month or other. The Marvel Fresh Start Initiative, and one of those I know particularly uh, uh, piques your interest. Yes. That is the, the, the that is the somewhat controversial and unique announcement of the uh, somewhat controversial and unique figure known only as Spider mm-hmm. taking over as the new writer of the Amazing Spider-Man. So, uh, Nick, uh, what are your thoughts on? Er, taking over as Spider-Man. We should pause to probably explain the mm, Spencer, uh, you know, bit. Uh, for those of you who weren't listening to the show back when Secret Empire was a thing, 
Um, you will recall, perhaps, that the controversial premise of that event saw Captain America turn to Hydra, and some believed it, you know, openly endorsed Nazism. Um, which there's a strong argument to be made for that in the, in the context of which the story was told. But so angry were people that they refused to refer to writer Nick Spencer by his full name, instead, you know, replacing many of the letters in his name with various symbols and expletives. And so, Greg and I, took up the running joke of calling him mm, Spencer. So now that we've explained the joke and thus rendered it no longer funny, let me continue on this talk. Um, I've come out and said, you know, been on record as being one of the people who liked Secret Empire. I didn't have a problem with the concept, and I think it was largely, for nine out of the ten issues, a very well-done superhero event. Um, granted, as Marvel tends to do, they struggle to stick the landing, but, you know, the event building up to that was really good, really solid, in my opinion. Uh, Nick Spencer also... Had a pretty good run on Captain America, uh, Super Soldier, or, or, yeah, Steve Rogers' Captain America, what I've read of it anyway. Now, granted, it also deals with the Hydra stuff, so a lot of people dismiss it out of hand. Um, I've read a little bit of, of his comedy book, The Superior Foes of Spider-Man, that was great. And he also wrote some stuff uh, late in the existence of the Ultimate Universe, that, I, from what I understand, that was pretty good. So, you know, what I've read of Nick Spencer's stuff, I, I generally like. And I've made no secret of the fact that I think Dan Slott's Spider-Man is an abomination from hell that should have never lasted as long as it did. So the fact that we're getting rid of Dan Slott and replacing him with a writer that I generally respect the work of, I'm really pumped. You know, I'm a huge Spider-Man fan who hasn't read Amazing Spider-Man in years solely because of Dan Slott. So I'm excited to be able to jump back on that title starting with the number one. Then you throw in the fact that while I am not overly familiar with Ryan Otley, there are many people who say he's one of the best superhero artists going today based on his work on Invincible. On Invincible. So Marvel getting right. him in the bag to come, write, come draw Spider-Man it seems to be a true all-star creative team, at least in terms of what's available to Marvel from a writing standpoint right now. Yes, uh, I I enjoyed what I read of uh, Nick Spencer's Superior Foes of Spider-Man. It was mm -hmm. a very uh, didn't last very long, but I liked what I read of it. It was only a couple of issues. Uh, I was pretty ambivalent about his Captain America run, but uh, I think it's interesting to see new blood there for Spider-Man for sure. And I'm particularly excited about Ryan Otley to see what he has to bring to the table. I've never read Invincible, but I've seen some of the art and I've always heard great things about his work. So it should be an interesting ride. Yep. Can't wait. Now, one of the other things that got announced was the uh, impending return of uh, a, a prominent Marvel character from the uh, first decade of the 2000s. Um, which is the uh, alternatingly interesting and or Superman stand-in, The <laughs> Century. As he is, uh, he is returning in the, in the Fresh Start initiative and getting his own ongoing series, compellingly enough, written by Jeff Lemire, mm -hmm. drawn by Kim Jacinto, and it will be spinning out of his recent return in Doctor Strange. Um, and it will delve into the psychology of the Century, aka Bob Reynolds, which is which is compelling because I think the Century, as he was first envisioned, was very compelling. The, the sort of uh, psychological and mental aspects of this character were very intriguing, and then slowly he just got turned into a Superman stand-in, uh, uh, and eventually became. Uh, a laughing stock character of sorts. A laughing stock character of sorts, in my opinion. <laughs> and um, he, uh, uh, yeah, he just so like for instance, I, I'll, I'll, a story that a story that received some acclaim at the time, ten, twelve years ago, whenever it was, that I didn't like was World War Hulk. And one of the reasons I didn't like it was because the Hulk was written to be this invincible machine that. Literally, I don't. Well, not literally. I, I don't want to say that. That practically, for all intents and purposes, beat everyone in the Marvel universe that's a superhero. And then the only thing that can beat him is the Sentry, and they just punch each other until they both collapse, and they both <laughs> revert to a primordial form. And then Bruce Banner and Bob Reynolds are taken off in shackles or whatever. It it wasn't a compelling story. Is what I'm getting to. It wasn't a compelling ending. To such a to such a story, and it wasn't that iconic like Superman and Doomsday beat each other to death moment because they didn't actually die. It was just it was just they just got tired. They just decided, all right, well, it's a tie, you know. Uh, and, and it was not satisfying, you know. 
it, it is a it is a it is a type of finish that to me should be used more often. Folks, they went to a time limit draw, a seven issue time limit draw. I think it was only five issues to be fair. It felt like seven. <laughs> Your disdain for the way the century was handled in that era of Marvel is is is, oh, is good stuff. I like it. It was it was it was. You want to talk? So many times I had to listen when I was a kid to Marvel fans talk about how overpowered Superman was. Overpowered. He's OP. Nobody cares about a character that's overpowered. And then the century was more overpowered than Superman had been since the 1970s. Mm. It was it was ridiculous. <laughs> And he was fighting, by the way, another character who was overpowered to a degree that Superman hadn't been since the 70s in the Hulk. Greg Pak's Hulk. But that's another story for another time. <laughs> uh, good stuff. I have nothing to say. I just wanted to hear you bitch about the century. Moving yeah, on. Yeah, by the way, folks, all, all, all uh, disclosing the, how the sausage is made backstage, uh, I didn't even want to do this topic. I didn't find it interesting enough. But Nick insisted because he wanted to hear rant about the century. Yes, so that's true. Blame him. Don't blame me. Or blame Canada. <laughs> a rare South Park reference from you. Wow. Those are few the, and far uh, between. The, uh, the Not to be completely outdone, DC Comics also had an announcement this week, and that is the announcement of a new line of Sandman titles hmm. headed up by Sandman co-creator Neil Gaiman. Mm-hmm. Uh, he will oversee a, co- a new DC imprint. That will consist. Uh, that will be called. Uh, start with a rather a special called Sandman Universe, and uh, it will uh, kind of spin off into four titles that will explore this incredible D universe that uh, Gaiman developed. Uh, the Book of Magic, The Dreaming, House of Whispers, <laughs> and Lucifer. Now, what I want to know is, will the House of Whispers ever make it into the Wind? Wind. Because you can't have a whisper without it going at some point into the wind. The whisper in the wind. Wind. <laughs> oh. uh, anyway. You know, this is, uh, this is a, undoubtedly a newsworthy topic, but it's one I can't really talk about because I've ne- literally never read I've any never Sandman read Sand stuff. Sand I know here. that's a massive gap in my fanboy knowledge in terms of how critically acclaimed it is and generally beloved. Um, and looks beautiful from everything I've seen. I've just never read any. <laughs> so I can't right, – uh, I have nothing to say about this topic. I'm glad it's happening for those people who are fans, and it's good to see Neil Gaiman continuing to do uh, work with DC. But other than that, I can't really comment on it too much. Yes, absolutely. I, I agree with all that because I, I would love to uh, get into the same man at some point. But it feels like a big time investment you know, to really get into this series, mm-hmm. and it's hard to find the time right now with us doing a weekly series – which we put so much time and effort into. Mm-hmm. So anyway, uh, we also have another DC announcement, and that is that your boy, Brian Michael Bendis, mm-hmm. is bringing Jinx World over and launching two new titles mm-hmm. with uh, artists Michael Gatos mm-hmm. and David Mack. Yes, um, his uh, Jessica Jones collaborators for uh, interiors and covers sp- uh Respectively, these titles, Pearl, mm-hmm. and Cover, and I'm going to let you talk about these for a moment since this is more in your in your wheelhouse. Yeah, so Pearl is going to be done uh, with interior from Gatus, who is typically Bendis's Jessica Jones and Alias uh, collaborator, with Mac being on covers as he as he usually is, and apparently it's going to focus on a Yakuza tattoo artist who falls in love with her enemy. Um, and is, she ends up uh, joining the staff of head coach Bruce Pearl, right? <laughs> yes, one can only hope. So heavy FBI involvement there. Um, but no, like that one, you know, that, that book sounds interesting just because of the creative team, but the premise doesn't set my world on fire. It's something I'll probably read and trade at some point. But uh, cover actually sounds really interesting to me. This is one that David Mack himself is going to do the interiors for, which is very rare in terms of at least anything with the mainstream uh, publicity for for Mac to do interiors, and it's it's going to focus on a comic book creator who is recruited into the into the world of spies. So it it makes for a really interesting kind of meta premise that you know I'm I'm all about. Uh, love the meta stuff. So I am looking forward to uh, to to reading this at some point. Uh, Bend is saying 
Who has a better cover story than comic book art and writers who get to travel the world and no one is actually paying attention to what they're doing? <laughs> um, and we're going to have a lot of fun examining the world of espionage through the worlds of Comic-Con. Such an interesting premise and seems like something that should be right up a uh, hardcore comic fan's uh, alley. I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. Oh, yeah. Both premises sound good to me. I, I'm always a sucker for comics taking place in Japan, mm -hmm. as you know. And, um, and, uh, and, and, yeah, that cover concept sounds tremendous. So uh, looking forward to that stuff. Should be interesting to keep track of. And that brings the end of the rundown, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure we missed a lot of stuff, but we'll try to get it next week and have a little bit of a, a shorter first part of the show. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get right into it, man. It's time for uh, that segment where we talk about what we've been reading and watching. It's a segment we like to call Reading and Watching. Reading and Watching. What you been reading and watching? What you been reading and watching? Now, Nick, uh, what you been reading? Nothing. I have read something. What'd you read? Well, I, I dug into my, my stash of roughly uh, eight-month-old comics that I've been... Uh, Only eight months? I, I think you're giving yourself a little bit too much credit there. And I've dug through two issues of Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps that mm. I read this past week. Mm -hmm. I read Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps number 16. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I read Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps number 17. Yes, tell us about these comics from a year ago. And uh, these two comics were both excellent. One was – both were written by Robert Venditti. One drawn by Rafe Sandoval. They're drawn by Ethan Van Skyver. Uh, the first one is a an issue that – virtually the entire issue is a fist fight between Arkillo and Guy. Oh, Hall. yeah, yeah. Great issue. And this was a great issue, yeah, with complete with flashbacks to Guy's childhood. Mm-hmm draws upon inspiration to keep him in the fight against a vastly superior physical foe. Uh, so if you love Guy Gardner, this is the issue for you. Uh, and then the follow-up is number 17, where we see uh, Guy have a, have a shocking heart-to-heart -heart moment with Arkillo as he's on his, uh, his injury bed. And we also see Kyle Rayner regain the classic crab mask and become a Green Lantern once more. Yes. So another great issue. Both of these were great. If I had to rank them, I'd go 16 and then 17, but both were great issues. Yeah, I remember those. Those were very good. I, I completely agree. So glad to hear you You dug back into that and enjoyed what you read. Yes. Um, and that's it for reading. So let's move along, shall we, to watching. Hey, our stories are back after another random CW break. Yes, the stories are back, and and uh, certainly it's interesting to see how things are shaking in Salem and uh, what, what the next uh, the next twist in the uh, the ever-evolving lives of uh, super couples like John and Marlena and Bo and Hope are going to be as our stories continue. I don't know what the fuck you're blabbering about. Damn it! thought I was doing a Days of Our Lives podcast again. All right, well... Uh, no, you would have to do that podcast with... Literally anyone else but me, if you were going to do that. Um, well, Nick, when I make Days of Our Lives references, just, just think of it as like when you make Kevin Smith references to me. The difference being that you've actually seen Kevin Smith movies. I've only seen a few, though. You've never seen any Days of Our Lives episodes? I, I honestly don't think I have. Man, <laughs> you poor sheltered child. You don't even know about the possession of Marlena? My goodness. I know about Marlena, but stories of our time. you know, all I know about is the cigar and the, and the little gold dress. Oh, uh, hmm. nah. Nah, it got yeah. me off track here. <laughs> my, my point being, my point being <laughs> Monday brought us back to the CW mm -hmm. universe, yep. and it did so with a show called Legends of Tomorrow that has just, Nick, it's batting pretty close to a thousand this season. Man. Yeah, it's it just really every. Is. Every episode out, Legends of Tomorrow just knocks it out of the park. This was another uh, episode where, in this case, it, it's basically taking place back in the pirate days of Blackbeard, mm -hmm. who, as it turns out, is actually quite the coward. Yes, comical and, take uh, on that character. And uh, so we we get a an e the rare episode that focuses on Amaya and also is interesting. Yes. So yes. Um, <laughs> I thought this one did a 
this one actually went a long way to making me. We talked about a couple weeks ago how they made me made us care about uh, uh, Zari, and now they're making us care about Amaya. And right. I think that was a brilliant move by them. Uh, she was far more entertaining in this episode than she often is. She's presented much more as a fully fleshed out persona. I love that she went along with the pirate act to the extent that she did. Um, really good episode as always with with Legends. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, enjoyed all the pirate stuff. Even enjoyed the uh, Sarah and um, oh, <laughs> what's the agent's name? I forget. Ava. Ava, Sarah Ava. and Ava on their first date. I thought that was a cool little subplot with them trying to have a normal night out and stuff. And then, you know, I uh, thought it had, um, you know, good uh, character development there near the uh, end of the episode as well. So Right. They've done a lot to rehabilitate the character of Ava, mm-hmm. I think, in, in our eyes. Yes. Yes, that's true. And, uh, yeah, I like the episode, so we'll move on from that awkward uh, sidetrack. Tuesday brought us to Central City with The Flash coming back in an episode that uh, shockingly involves country music. Yeah. Or, or at least what passes for country music. So, yes. Um, the, uh, uh, the continued uh, Eobard – not Eobard Thawne, for God's sake – the continued uh, uh, plot of The Thinker. As he attempts to, or she at this point, attempts to uh, round up all of the bus metas, continues, and the gang r- learns about this new co- this country singer who has developed sonic powers. And they go and try to help her. In the process, Ralph ends up falling hard for her fast, and it leads to a, uh, a fateful showdown with DeVoe, Clifford DeVoe, that is. In which DeVoe ch- switches bodies once more from mm-hmm. one woman to another, taking over the country singer, whose name I've forgotten. And um, now she is DeVoe as he mm-hmm. continues to uh, not romance his wife enough for my life. Yeah, I think it's important. For, he's going through a lot of changes. His bodies, you know, obviously there's a, there's a period of transition here, but it's important, I think, that he and his wife – you have to maintain that physical intimacy. You have to make sure that you're, re- you know, really placing a, an importance on that because that helps you to grow sh- you know, closer together and keep that emotional attachment. You know, there's a right. there's a there's a heavy correlation between the emotional and the physical. You see, and so yes, um, I you know I've not I, I, unlike you, Nick, you have a lot more knowledge of this because you're married. I've, I've not been married, but I've studied a lot of the the. <laughs> The You've studied marriage their, from afar, yes, <laughs> yes. A lot of the greats in their writings about marriage have mm-hmm. written that. Without consistent physical intimacy, uh-huh. the love can truly die. It can yeah. truly evaporate, and I feel like that may be something that the show wants to look at in, in the near future, particularly uh, if they want to maintain the integrity of the DeVoe characters yes. and, their, and their marriage, which yeah. appears, to, in my opinion, from my observations, to be essential aspects of their being. Yes, I would agree. I would agree wholeheartedly. And undoubtedly, you know, you can see the love die uh, once the physical physical – Fades away, which is why you see so many marriages into divorce. So there you are. That's exactly right. Uh, uh, and and as fans of professional wrestling, you know we know all about that. You know, we've seen the love die for wrestlers such as uh, Hulk Hogan, uh, Ric Flair, Bret Hart, uh, basically every wrestler that's ever lived <laughs> or been married. Yeah, but in all seriousness, Greg, um, I like this episode a lot. Um, I don't fully understand. I, I guess they're trying to say that like. When he transfers into a new body, it, it causes that body to like decay or something. So mm-hmm. he has to constantly hop from body to body. But mm-hmm. uh, you know, other than that, uh, that right. that unresolved question. I really like this episode. Uh, and I'm actually shocked by that, Nick. I thought her accent would drive you. Oh, the accent was awful. But you know, there were certain redeeming qualities. Certain redeeming qualities. The accent was awful. But getting to see everybody else back uh, after after the break was mm-hmm. good, and and getting Ralph. Kind of being smitten with her was funny and stuff, and yeah. you know we 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 just have to come to expect at this point, Greg, that they're never going to portray Southern accents realistically, <laughs> especially not on a, on a CW show. So you know yeah. that is what it is. But I still like the episode, yes. and um, you know as I as I said in our group chat, uh, the country music chick, I'll I'll allow it. And and my uh, my overall summation of this one be it was all right. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I was I really it. happy to. 
I was really happy to see the show back, but it yeah. was just kind of you know by the by the numbers uh, right. flash. Uh, but but you know again, even when it's by the numbers, it's still pretty good. So um, now also on Tuesday night was Black Lightning, mm-hmm. and we taught they took a random one week break. Uh, Winter Olympics, you see. Up. Yes, Winter Olympics ratings juggernaut. Winter Olympics. And uh, God, I wish that was a sarcastic comment, not a true one. Right. And uh, we had talked before that break about how Black Lightning finally reached an episode that felt samey, felt mm-hmm. safe, felt, you know, overall not that impressive, right? Right. Uh, not not bad necessarily, yeah, just, just kind of kind of so The first time you can see the wheels spinning a little bit. Right. Well, in my opinion anyway, and we'll see if you agree, we actually haven't talked about this ahead of time. I thought Black Lightning bounced back in a big, bad way uh, last week. Came back with a hard-hitting, social-focused episode uh, that, to me, picked up on the threads of the first few episodes in a way that almost made me question at first whether it was meant to air earlier than it did. uh, Because it picks up a lot of the threads of the first episode where uh, the older daughter, uh, Anissa, is a... Uh, an activist. We haven't really seen her be an activist much since then, and here she's back in that role big time. And again, I thought I thought this was a tremendous episode. Mm-hmm. We get to uh, continue to see uh, the development of her powers as she becomes Thunder, and uh, the continued mystery of what the deal is. With I can never remember his name, but the tailor, the guy that is helping oh, Black Lightning, yeah. We continue to see a little bit more unraveling of his thread of what what exactly his deal is, and we see that he has stronger ties to the bad guys than we initially thought. And uh, and of course, Tobias Hoyle continues to be a compelling villain, um, and the acting continues to be strong. The writing continues to be strong. Uh, I loved this one, man. I thought this was a really great episode of Black Lightning. Yeah, I really enjoyed it as well. You know, continuing the Anissa subplot, uh, getting to see, you know, Jefferson Pierce get a few answers as to what's going on with him. Um, the interesting parallels they're, they're drawing between what is going on with him physically and what happens to the users of this green light drug. Um, mm-hmm. Enjoyed all that. And then, of course, this Gamby character, while I still don't think it's being very well portrayed, at least it's being written in an interesting way to where I wonder if perhaps there isn't some sort of massive twist coming with him at some point. So I am intrigued to see where that character is going. He definitely feels like he's playing both sides of the fence at this point. He wants to, he wants, it feels like he wants to protect both Jefferson and Tobias, Mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. So uh, I, I've, I've been a fan of all that and it's, uh, it's just an excellent, an excellent show, man. Another killer. All right, so let's bring it on to Thursday night and Green Arrow and Friends on oh, Arrow. Good lord! Um, and uh, uh, so this was an episode that <sighs> put the teams truly at odds with one another. This was an episode that had me like, you know, maybe it's a truly a hallmark of a great episode, Greg. Maybe it is, you know, because it's a lot like pro wrestling, where there are very rare occasions these days where. I set mm-hmm. my my knowledge of the of the inner workings of it aside, and I genuinely want to see one party get pummeled at the hands of another party. And that was pretty much what this episode was, because by the end of it, yep. it was like I wanted all of the new team to be crippled brutally or murdered outright. <laughs> yes. Like it it has reached a point where there is nothing, not a single thing redeeming about any of those characters. No, not even Dinah. <laughs> no, because they've arguably made her the most insufferable of them. Oh my god. I that that th- so basically this was an episode that has Oliver and Felicity and Diggle trying to uh, get to the bottom of uh, where this money is that had been extorted uh, from Caden by Caden James. The money is now gone, disappeared into the wind, and they believe that Laurel is the only the only one who knows where it is. And of course, she's not going to give it over willingly. Uh, and her uh, her dad's been protecting her after she was nearly killed at the hands of, of Black Canary, who is still out for revenge for her uh, dead lover, the vigilante. So Black Canary and her team are trying to find Laurel so that she can get her revenge. Oliver and his team are trying to find Laurel so that they can find this money and 
keep all of the essential services in the city from shutting down. Um, and so we end up with a true civil war of OTA versus uh, NTA, I guess, New Team Arrow. And uh, l let's just say that there is no question as to the fans' loyalties in this battle. I don't see how the writers think this is... If the episodes were being written in such a way to suggest that New Team Arrow was actually the antagonist or that they were actually the right. villains of this season, then it would be one thing. But they are being written in such a way to make you feel as if the writers are intending that we as viewers are to be conflicted, to be torn by, no, there, by there seeing there these two no teams. Conflict. And there is no conflict. There's not even close to conflict. There is not even like the no. basis of understanding for a conflict. It is... I want to see them gone. Like, to me... Oliver is... The only thing... The only thing I've agreed with the new team on is killing Laurel. That's the only thing I've agreed with them on, and that's only because of my long-standing hatred of any of the characters that she plays. But, I will say, you're right. Oliver's been right every step of the way. Oliver and Felicity and, and John. And that's what tells you, if, if, they, if Diggle and Felicity agree with Oliver on something... To me, that closes the case. Yes, it's done. It's over. And not to mention, you know, I will give him a little bit of credit in this one. Other than Dinah, because because she has powers, uh, new or old Team Arrow kind of pretty well handed handed new Team yes. Arrow their ass. I, I, I was going to say, best part of the episode: Oliver kicking the living shit out of Renee. Yes, because which I could have watched an entire episode because they're not on the level, and they shouldn't be portrayed as being on the level, no. and they shouldn't have the the bizarre, you know. <laughs> the bizarre cockiness to believe they're on that level. I yes. just, I'm so over it at this point. I'm. I know Mr. Terrific, and Mr. Terrific can't beat the Green Arrow. Now, can you argue with that? Can you disagree with that? Hell no. And like, it's reaching a point where, you know, the Damian Dark season, Greg had some moments that were kind of eye roll worthy and kind of like you kind of wondered what what was really the point of it all. But I never ha actively hated a subplot. From the Damien Dark season, as much as I hate this subplot, like, well, the good news is Renee Renee's injuries were so severe that he has to be transferred to a hospital outside of Star City. Yeah, but he'll so, come back in like three weeks. You know, it's just that's true. I am ready for this thing to be done. I'm ready for it to be over, and I want Arrow. I thought Arrow had finally found its footing again after last season, and I am, you know, I well, am, and the thing I is, am, just two episodes ago, they had an awesome episode, right? So it's like. The season is still producing great episodes, but they're just like – they're being interrupted by these episodes of, of skips. Now, I will say this. I actually like the episode. Yeah, I like – I've complained about it. I, like I thought it was a good episode. Too, but I'm just – I just don't like these characters. Right. Uh, and and it, it just proves me right what I've been saying for, th what, three seasons now, two and a half seasons. Let's, let's, let's remember that the show is called Arrow. Right. It's not called Team Arrow. It's not called Justice League. It's not called Justice Society. It's not Legends of Tomorrow. It's Arrow. Let's kind of forget about Mr. Terrific and frickin' uh, Wild Dog, for God's sake. And let's let's remember that the main character of the show is is Oliver Queen. And let's focus on that again, right? Let's 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 forget about these bastard characters that no one wants. If you want, if you have to have Mr. Terrific. Put them on Legends. Right. You know, if you have to have Wild Dog, why would you have to have Wild Dog? Make him a, a an only occasionally appearing once in a while during the season character. Like a, like like they had, a, you know, Wildcat on in the early seasons, remember? Oh, he yeah, He popped yeah. up like twice. Yeah. That's fine. I can deal with very limited Wild Dog. But enough of this. And to make matters worse, they're about to remind – I don't know if you saw the preview of the next episode, Nick. But they're about to remind us of a team arrow that I can deal with. Yes. A team because arrow that made sense. Awesome. Yeah, because it was a team arrow that made sense as opposed to just yes. a team arrow because Felicity thinks there needs to be a team, even though she no longer thinks right. that. Right. We're about to get Roy Harper and uh, and uh, and uh, Speedy back, so that's going to be pretty pretty cool. So yeah, I I, I actually like the episode. But I agree, it's time. It's way past time to finish off these jobbers. So, with that being said, time to rank them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you want to go first? Sure, I'll go Legends at one. I will go Black Lightning at two. I will go 
Well, I'll go Flash at three and Arrow at four. Um, and I, I ultimately liked all the episodes. I just Arrow frustrated me more than than Flash did. Is where I would fall. Very good. I will go Black Lightning's back at number one. I'll go Legends at number two. I'll go Arrow at number three, and I'll go Flash at number four. Um, and again, I liked all the episodes, but I thought Flash was a little bit under underwhelming compared to what it has been at times. So there we there we have it. There's our rankings, and that's gosh, that's the end of reading and watching. Can you believe it? No, it's not. Oh no, it isn't. No, it's not the end of reading and watching. That's right. Wait, there's more because we've got. As if the death of Carl wasn't enough. Ladies and gentlemen, the king is dead. Long live the king. And by the king, I mean a group of useless characters that never should have been on The Walking Dead in the first place. The (laughs) trash people are gone. Spoiler alert, the trash people are gone. Yes? They've, They've been murdered. They've been killed. Simon finally did something right. And he, and, he, and he he stroked his hey, mustache. Hey, 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 Simon grew that mustache. That's not the only thing yeah, he's ever done saying, right. He stroked his impressive mustache, swiveled his hips around, and then ordered his men to gun down all the trash people in an act of betrayal, except for Jadis, who was then forced to drop her act of not knowing how to talk because there are zombies suddenly, and sitting on top of a garbage heap and turning all of her former uh, uh, friends... Subjects, countrymen—I don't know—turning them into turning them into a rudimentary paste <laughs> via a trash compactor. Yes, she certainly she certainly did that. It was uh, it was as if the writers of this particular episode took every fan complaint and every fan fiction written about the trash people and made it come true. That's except a, for Jadis Live. Except for Jadis living and surviving, so worried that she'll have a larger role to play going forward. But, but yeah, ultimately, other stuff happened in this episode, but I don't really care. Ultimately, <laughs> it was about the end of the trash people. Yeah, while, yeah, while I, I definitely liked seeing the trash people come to an end, other than that, I thought the episode was kind of kind of boring. Like, I thought I, I, you had some good stuff with Rick and, and Negan having a little conversation, yes, but, but like all this stuff about can we can we find a peaceful solution and all that crap? I am already. I'm tired of it, and we're only like two episodes into Carl's vision of the future being the new the fir- direction for the show. The first, the first half of the episode was very boring, I thought, but I thought the second half was very good with the trash people stuff and then the, uh, the, the Rick and Negan confrontation. But I will say another group, the next group of people that needs to be uh, genocided on the show. Oceanside. Is, uh, Oceanside. Oh, yes. my gosh. So awesome. boring. Every episode that involves them is boring. Yes. It's not. Every subplot of any episode that involves them is boring. Like, not good. Oh, oh, you just murdered my grandmother in front of me, but I'm not going to react to it. I'm just going to be oddly calm about the whole thing. Yes. When, you, when you're focusing on Enid to be the most interesting part of the scene, that's, I think that's how you know your scene has problems. Yes, Enid, Enid of all people, Enid was having to carry scenes in, the, in this episode. Because everyone else you know, is so useless. Enid is a character that's been on the show for what, like two and a half seasons now, and I'm tur- I'm still not entirely sure what the point of her character is, especially right. now that Carl is gone. Right. Well, she doesn't know Carl's gone yet. So oh God! Another co- go another scene brooding. of Carl moping, I, and that's exactly what we need on this show. As if we didn't get enough of it in this episode. But I, but, Can't we but, all just you know, be happy was, and move along? I thought she was good here. The thing that is weird is when did she and Aaron just beca- have this awesome bond between each other? The so show does things, screen. Greg. They just do things off screen. They develop these characters in these time gaps and expect you to just accept that the characters are vastly so, different people so than now, when you last Now Aaron them. is a surrogate father for Enid? I don't know. Yeah, it makes no but sense. Enid did a good job. I thought all, again, the thing, that's, the thing that helps The Walking Dead every week, even when it has an off week, is I think in general the acting is very, very good. Yeah, the acting is very good even if the writing isn't, and it still right. has like, you know, one of the most dynamic characters right now on television and Negan. So anytime he's right. on screen, it, it's yep. you can't your eyes can't turn he was, away. He was great and, and the end of the trash people. So that's why I give this episode a pass. But I acknowledge that it was kind of boring up to that point. And also the uh as 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 I think Russell put it on Facebook, the pulp fiction style effect of the different titles of the characters oh, that was so didn't cheesy. didn't work at all. So didn't cheesy, work at all. I thought but yeah, it could have own. worked if they had actually focused on different characters, but it, but they didn't really. It was it was still involving all these other people that were 
And the, like, what's the point of having Rick and Michonne divided into different segments when they're both in the same segments together? Who knows? Anyway, so yeah, you know, not the best episode, but at least they're starting to jettison some of the dead weight from the show. Hopefully that will continue in the coming weeks. And not in uh, the form of Maggie, as the rumor currently is. Oh, God, that would be horrible. Yes. That would be horrible. No, the next the next prominent deaths need to be, uh, let me see, Oceanside. Mm-hmm. Um, who else would I like to Father see Gabriel. Go? Father Gabriel. Had many sons. Many sons had Father Gabriel. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, uh, is uh, is what's his name still around? Gregory is he still around? Yes, he needs to die. He needs to die. Mm-hmm. That long haired savior. He needs to die. That long haired savior. You know that long haired savior that's locked up at the uh, hilltop right now. Now is he a long haired country boy? Oh, but you know, speaking of country boys, Nick, I hear that somebody's been messing with country boys. Yeah, I I saw a little bit of that going on on a certain Facebook message thread, and uh, you know. I would watch myself, you know. I know, I know you folks out there in California think you're think you're safe from the wrath of what might happen if you go messing with a country boy, but I would not recommend it, quite frankly. Yeah, I wouldn't mess around with a country boy. I mean, mm. d- listen, you may be able to survive the main streets of Sacramento mm-hmm. hypothetically if you were to make such a comment. Yeah, but but you would not be able to survive the main streets of Mudlick, Kentucky. I re- that's right, and you got to remember you're you're about to make a make a trip down south. You don't want to be. Listen, I just wouldn't press my luck is all I'm saying. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that long-haired savior, I don't know, he may have already died, but he's locked up in the pen. He's that, he's that, he needs to die. Okay, and then I would like to see all of Negan's lieutenants die slowly, and then Negan at the end of the season. As much as I love Negan, he's got to die. That's just how it is. If he wants to take Rick with him, all the better. Yeah, I mean... I don't want to see Ne. Ne- I'm conflicted because I don't want to see Negan die because it would mean that Jeffrey Dean Morgan was no longer on the show. Right. But I also don't want to see him become redeemed, which is what they seem to be right. moving towards. I definitely don't want to see Negan and Rick picking vegetables next to one. God one. Almighty, Carl! So, sorry, Carl's sorry boring vision of the murdered. future. I mean, even in this episode when ne- Negan was talking to Rick and he's like, "That's why I had to murder your friends," was to make you see how things can be. I was like, "No, that's not a." That's not an exception. And what about Negan like, you know, damn it, I had plans for that boy. He was going to be the future. (laughs) What kind of plans did he have for Carl? And what did Carl ever do to indicate that he was going to be the future of multiple groups of people? Nick, what kind of plans did old Stu have for young (laughs) young Carl? (laughs) Prospective wrestlers that would take him down in the basement and and stretch him a little bit. Stretch him. Yeah. Rub a little bit of oil behind the ears there. Yeah. Uh, Greased up head, slip slip at it anywhere. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, with all that being said, now we are finally done with reading and watching. And you know, there's not much left to say in this episode, Nick. What do we have coming to people's way in the coming weeks? Well, we're going to finish up this month. We have, of course, our landmark 100th episode next week, as we are going to do a very special edition of Countdown where we've been accused of being DC fanboys in the past, which is probably true. So we're going to do probably one of the more difficult countdowns we've done where we are going to have to narrow down our five favorite DC comic stories of all time. That's DC comic stories in general from across the publishing pantheon. Mm -hmm. Tremendously hard to narrow it down to five. We're going to have to see how that goes. Um, And then we're going to wrap up the month with a very special long book uh, hunt on the Court of Owls, the landmark first volume from Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo's acclaimed New 52 Batman run, uh, before getting into the month of April, where we will be investigating uh, Captain America Civil War and the latest installment of our Hard Travelers for Hire series. And I'm sure we have some other things on the docket, but I am not can't remember exactly what they are now. And tentatively scheduled for the end of this month is a very, yeah, very special edition of Giant Size uh, that will be the second volume of Place to Be Nation Pop Comic Book Theater. And, and I have to say, folks, we've gotten the majority of the recording now for this special mm-hmm. in the can, and I have to say, in my in my opinion, my objective opinion, I feel like we elevated it to even greater heights this time than we did the first time. Then the first time out? Yeah, I, I, would, <laughs> I would tend to agree with that. It is, it is unique from beginning to end. 
Uh, before we go, I would like to invite everyone that is listening to this to please go to Place to Be Nation Pop if you're interested. If you like this show at all, or even if you hate this show, honestly, go listen to some of the other shows on PTB and Pop. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sellers Points Podcast, uh, Geek and Sassy, uh, Sunday Groove. Easy like David Sunday. Easy like David Sunday, if you prefer, which is for music buffs out there. Uh, you know, uh, Imaginary Stories Podcast. Imaginary Stories Podcast. Conversation Comics with Todd Weber and Tim Capel. Uh, we've got, uh, and we've got a brand new podcast for people that maybe aren't into comics but want to hear about other pop culture stuff. Talk and Pop with Jenny and Tim. Uh, very good first episode. Uh, so uh, we've just got a litany, a, a, a vertible heaven. Of, of podcasts here on on the feed please go check all of them out and right now i think i'm gonna see a minute on the clock oh there. god that here we go it's, it's time for the wrestling minute and we're gonna start that right now so nick the wrestlemania card is coming up what do you make of it so far i don't really care about the wrestlemania card what about the nxt takeover new orleans card right now greg on the card you have after tonight's, uh, the spoilers from this, these, this week's tapings, you have a triple threat tag title match between the Authors of Pain, Roderick Strong, and Pete Dunne, and the, uh, the Undisputed Era. You also have the six-way North American NXT title match between EC3, Ricochet, Killian Dane, uh, Lars Sullivan, uh, and the Velveteen Dream. And then you have, of course, uh, Andrade Cien Almas against uh, Aleister Black for the NXT title and the rumored Johnny Gargano Tommaso Ciampa unsanctioned match. I am more excited for that than I am for Mania at this point. Oh, it looks incredible. It looks absolutely incredible. What a card. NXT always puts together a great card. I'm also looking forward to AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura if we get that match. In theory, yes. And and also uh, to see what else they have coming the way. And also Capone, Capone's better coming to town. What's going to happen when Capone gets here? What's Bogart got to say about it? Hear that and all that small on the on the wrestling minute. Woo! One minute. Mm. One minute, Nick, of, of the greatest wrestling talk you ever did here, mm-hmm. right here at the Hard Traveling Fanboys. That has been the wrestling minute. This has been the Hard Traveling Fanboys. Please tune in next week. We'll try to do better. Hard traveling fanboys, 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 hard traveling fanboys.